morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello kids and welcome to season four and episode number 379 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Smoothed right out of that one there, kids. Ha. Uh, <laughs> Today, recording day, is Friday. It's Friday, 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 May the 10th. It's Friday, May the 10th. It's Friday, May the 10th. Ah, 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 I love it. I love it. 2024. And uh, it's. Uh, it looks like the sun is going to try to fight its way through here at the Beaver Lodge here today. But uh, a little cool this morning. I'm your host. The eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast funding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. We have our usual Friday show for you, I hope. But before we do, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing today. And I will note that I got the episode number and the date and the sponsors right this time. Boom, stuck the landing. Mr. Grizzly. I'm having a good start. How are you doing? <laughs> Little victories, eh? Little victories. More than I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm just, um, I gotta get. I'm on my first coffee, so I'm not fully. I need my go-go juice. That's when I look at Lola in the morning. I'm like, Daddy needs his go-go juice. And she's like, what The hell are you talking about? I get my go-go juice after I take her for a walk. It's like a reward. <laughs> go-go uh, juice. Coffee. I haven't, heard that. Coffee. I haven't heard that in a long time. What was it? Oh, oh God, I can't remember now. Oh. I can't the, remember one. Oh, it was the reality show with the, the mother, June, and the kid who was the, the pageant kid. What? Oh, go, go, juice. It comes, it, I think it comes from that reality show. I don't know what the reality show is. I, uh, remember. I can't remember now. Somebody must. Did, somebody must know darn but yes it was it was this like reality show about like pageants like kids pageants whatnot and then one person like one kid became like really really famous and then there was like a whole industry built around her for a while i can't remember her name whatsoever honey boo boo yes honey boo boo thank you kids <laughs> thank you never never watched it neither did i i just know that that's where it's like i need my go-go juice Oh, I never heard that. <laughs> I've been calling coffee go-go juice for a long time. I never heard. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. It probably exists before that, but that's that's how I, I heard about it the first time. Um, all right. Well, um, lots of news going on. Uh, it, it's been an interesting week in that mm -hmm. there hasn't like been big explosive things there, but there's been lots of undercurrent little things and things that had color and texture and things are moving forward, but it's the way that people are positioning themselves. Um, and then of course there's 
a heck of a lot going on internationally. Uh, there's 50 elections this year. So, I mean, there's been elections like in, in Panama yeah, and North Macedonia. And, and Isn't there 84 globally this year, something like that? 50, I think, this year, 84 over the next two years. Oh, is that what it is? Right, or something like that. But just tons of them. I mean, Putin was just... Um, inaugurated, I guess you would call it for the fifth time. And then there was victory day, which is the day in, uh, in Russia where they celebrate having, um, vanquished the Nazis uh, during the second world war. And, um, this year, Canada, the UK and the U S did not, did not really, well, didn't show up for it. Uh, but they weren't actually really invited either. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but France did. They did go, so not all the uh, G7 nations or NATO nations uh, didn't uh, didn't attend ceremonies, uh, or at least sorry the inauguration, not uh, the Victory Day stuff. Um, I believe uh, Spain also uh, attended the inauguration, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but so it's it's not some there's still some links, you know, when you're playing the foreign policy game, people going there still from the G7, but the big ones, you know, the UK and the US did not, but France did, but because France is trying to play some mediation role and they're trying to, you know, like we talk on the Israel and Gaza thing, what Canada is doing and trying to have one foot, you know, with Israel and one foot and trying, but not going so far. Um, Sorry, I'm not going so far in the admonishment of Israel that it could still have its ear um, playing that role. Whereas in this case, uh, when it comes to Ukraine and Russia, it's France that's doing that for the NATO alliance. Like this, while everybody's really condemning France, well, let's see if we could talk. Mm. That's that's the link maintaining that over there. Um, so. And, and uh, in Haiti, uh, the well, the former president has officially <clears throat> stepped down, and that now was there's expected. A, yeah, but the, now like the four main factions are sort of like this: have a person. There was a council, and they picked a relatively unknown person to be president, and it seems that there's not mass objection to it for the moment. So they have a leader and technically this would be the first time in its modern history that people from Haiti actually picked the leader of Haiti. Right. Even if, even if it's via interim council, that was so, um, so there's lots going on, you know, there's pieces on the chessboard internationally that are being moved as well. Um, we're not sure how it's uh, all going to play out. Either. Exactly. But there, there's lots of movement, and the general sense is that um, the climate is not good for incumbents right. overall. And I think we had like the, the president, uh, uh, the president of the prime minister of Ireland, also stepped down, saying, you know, he's had enough. That, mm -hmm. That's just like Jacinda Ardern. I don't have the passion anymore. Sorry. And uh, there's uh, some changes in Scotland as well. So, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's happening all over the place. You know, there, there's going, something going on. And then there were municipal elections uh, in uh, the UK. So we have Richie Sunak. And uh, those uh, did not go well for mm -hmm. the Conservative Party, like, at all. Like, in any way, shape, or form. They, I think they lost, like, 10 out of the 11 uh, sort of districts and same thing with city halls. Uh, Mayor uh, Sadiq Khan in London got reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll happen there. But uh, yeah, it's uh, not, it, it's not looking good uh, for them and it's looking pretty good for labor at the moment over there. So they're, they're, there are some places where the incumbents losing is not a bad thing, like mm -hmm. in the UK, and there are certain places where an incumbent losing would be a very bad thing, as in the United States. Right. Or here. Just, yeah. And, you know, a lot of people are, one of the reasons I'm not going all in or 
not making predictions whatsoever when it comes to the next election is because I truly, truly and sincerely and deeply believe that one main point of data that has not yet taken place yet that will factor greatly into how Canadians vote is what happens in the U.S. election. Right? If Joe, and how it's framed, if Joe Biden, if it's framed as Biden wins, does that make it more likely that we feel that we can take a chance with PB? Because, well, you know, at least the United States is stable, so we can gamble. Or... Does that make Canadians say, hmm, you know, we don't want an antagonistic relationship with our biggest trading partner, so we'll, uh, um, we'll go Trudeau. If it's framed as Biden loses, do we get scared as Canadians? Well, think, it's oh, certainly, maybe, you know, maybe something we don't want. Uh, right. If Trump if gets elected, I think that's bad for the planet. Yeah, not if it's just framed. the United States. Exactly, and then if it's framed as Trump wins or as Trump loses, Trump wins, do Canadians get scared and say, hmm, you know what, maybe a Trump and PP and Putin trifecta is maybe not what we want. And Modi and <laughs> all four at this NG at the same time. Maybe that's not, maybe, maybe we don't want that. Maybe, yeah. That, that might not be a good idea. So, yeah, I think until that happens, and maybe even like six months after that to see like, you know, if he comes in, uh, if Trump does win and he comes in, like move fast, break things, um, that may cause a lot of uh, spines to snap back. No, oh, no doubt. In Canada, and we said, mm, you know what? Maybe this PP experiment at this time. Not a bad idea. Yeah, was not the most most advisable way forward. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm very reluctant to say, even though I am seeing twenty point leads, which is concerning. I'm confused by the fact that the conservatives don't seem to be campaigning. Like they've got to leave. They're really campaigning. Like they have. They're campaigning like they have internal polling that's telling them that it's way closer um, than it is, than the numbers say. But I don't know, uh, or that there are certain grounds about to shift that's going to make it harder for them, one or the other, because the way that they're campaigning is very very strange. But until Canadians get a sense of what's going on in. Uh, what we affectionately call the meth lab in our basement. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of trees being sacrificed, let's say, for, <laughs> for speculative articles at the moment uh, that, uh, that are there to keep your interest if we're talking about media being a business, right? Or let's talk about the horse race all the time. And, oh, you know, and then the fear that a portion of the population feels when they see that uh, the horse that they do not want to win is taken in the lead and the excitement it, and mobilization it causes for some and then vice versa should it get a little tighter. And so that narrative, you know, if you're doing the media literacy thing, that that's there to keep you hooked on the story, but that's not necessarily the main story. Mm -hmm. Right. So just, be aware that however you might be feeling, yes, pay attention, pay attention, Certainly. I guess. But there are still some very, very, very key data points that can shift the entire psyche of a nation that are yet to come for us to take the, what the numbers are saying right now and running with it as an, as an inevitability. Right. Right. Some people are talking like this will definitely be a change election. We're not sure yet. We're not ready. I'm as a strategist and as someone that does the analysis, of, you know, of living does an analysis of the public environment. I would not be ready to confirm that just yet. Not this far out, right? Um, All right. Let's um, let's address the um, 
the passing of uh, a, a once great and respected journalist? Uh, uh, I, I, he, okay. he didn't. He Go didn't. Ahead. He didn't end the way he started. Let's put it that no. way. No. No. You know, uh, that's not how he started his career and how he ended his career. They're kind of two different, two different avenues. And I'm not going to dump on the man. I mean. I had lost all respect for him quite some time ago. Uh, he got, well, look, he was on stage with Tucker Carlson and Jordan Peterson in Edmonton with Daniel Smith. Uh, and the thing is, he wasn't trying to have a conversation with them from an opposing side. He was fully in, ensconced and in their camp. And uh, sorry, they're, they're terrible people doing terrible things. And that's my take. But for another take... Let's bring in our friend, James DeFiore. Gentlemen. Day, Hello there. Is my mic working? Yeah, it Yes, great. it is. It's okay. doing. It's good. Hey, my friend, how are you? Let I'm doing start. well, guys. How are you guys doing? How's, very well. How's your mental health doing today? Um, I didn't sleep very much last night, but otherwise I'm good. My cat is missing his testicles. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I did it a little bit late. At, at, I might be the first person to say this on your podcast, but there might be an interruption when a school bus falls off the top of the Christmas tree. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> My cat is going crazy. I, I We still have our Christmas tree up because we decided to make it like an all year round tree. So we put like, school stuff on it now and there's a dilapidated bus that we made on top. <laughs> oh yes and then my cat is running around somewhere just going absolutely ape shit and i don't know i don't know why or i do know why he's probably mad at me because his testicles are gone so yeah that would that would have something to do with it i'm sure yeah. <laughs> all right um now uh mr grizzly introduced the subject not how i necessarily would have introduced it but um not that I disagree uh, with uh, the point being made. Um, but yes, as time went on, uh, I'm guessing that uh, he has been considered um, more and more of a poor polarizing figure. So there will be lots of reaction, um, much similar to the one we had the other day, and I can't re for some reason, I cannot remember who it is we were talking about who had passed away, but we said somebody passed away. Good. That's it. Because we're going to speak good of the dead. <laughs> That's it. Uh, with Rex Murphy, there's a lot of people that will, uh, if they know him from the latter part of his career, whatnot, may be thinking that. But that might not be entirely fair if we look at the whole man. So No, I'm, I'm not looking at his whole no, career. No. It's just the last yeah, yeah. few years. He turned into Don Cherry in yeah. many ways. A cranky, old, crotchety, bitter old man. I, I agree with you. Shame. He didn't stick. I, I, I agree with you. He didn't stick the dismount. He did not. On a great career. Uh, and he had a long, long, great career, one that I respected yeah. for decades. But in the last five, ten years, he's gone right off the rails. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But I just... So there, there will be, but I just want to say that in the media and in online and whatnot, there's going to be a lot of focus on that. Of course. And we would just want to bring uh, a little bit of something broader, uh, you know, a, a wider, more nuanced perspective, better, a fully informed perspective uh, so that uh, we understand that Rex got to where he was and there was a certain reason for that. Yeah. Right. I, you, you, listen, I didn't agree with a lot of the stuff that he said, um, mm -hmm. but I think there's a difference between the quality of a person's, I don't know, character or soul and the fact that they had different opinions, right? Like right. if we say their opinions are wrong, then sorry, I got to squirt my cat. Get out of here. <laughs> I have a water bottle that I squirt. Out. Um, but the idea that, and we saw this happen when Rob Ford died and it always infuriates me when I go on social media or Twitter, especially and you see people who normally would describe themselves as really good progressives, uh, progressive who understands um, that uh, drug addiction is a disease mm -hmm. um, and that people should be respectful towards one another. And those same people dancing on the graves of people who uh, their bodies aren't even cold yet. Mm -hmm. And I always found that really, really hypocritical. And I saw it this morning on, uh, on Twitter again. Um, I emailed you guys, not because I thought you guys were doing anything, but I, I was noticing 
um, that people that I like or, or thought I liked um, were calling him petty and a fascist on the day that he died. And I'm like, what is more petty <laughs> than yeah. trashing someone on the day that they die? You know, um, he was, he had a long career. He was, he was actually quite eloquent uh, often. It's, you didn't like the words that he was saying maybe because it had a perspective that was different from yours. And I totally get that. But, um, you know, he, I don't think there's anything wrong with um, commentators expressing views like his because it shows that we have a diversity of opinion in this country. And if you disagree with him, I don't think that means that um, that he was wrong and you were right or vice versa. I think it's just we are so polarized that when someone uh, offers an opinion that we think is dead wrong or just different from ours, we tend to put them in that box forever. And even on the day that they die, we don't let them out of that box. And mm -hmm. I, I find that really, really disappointing. Yep. I can see that. Does the right do this? Do, do the right, do they yeah. dance on progressive graves when, because I don't, I, maybe I only notice it because I identify more as a moderate or a moderate progressive than I do a conservative. So when I notice that people that are quote unquote from my tribe or whatever you want to call it are being the heinous human beings, that maybe it bothers me more. I'm not sure if that's the reason, but I can't, I, I don't remember when Jack Layton died, um, conservatives like, yay, you know, like the commie's dead. I don't remember that happening. Actually, know? I do. Do you, yeah. If it happened, and, then I'm sure. You know. And then, and then there was Sun a lot TV of. Sun TV did it with Ezra Levant on Rebel News on Sun TV. They were celebrating. They were, yeah, they were basically dancing on his grave. Yeah, see, that was awful. disgusting. It was disgusting. Uh, uh, and a lot and I'm not people, doing that to Rex. I'm not. It's not something I would do. It's not who I am. A lot of, and then a lot of people say, "Oh, yeah, remember the massage parlor and you know, try to reduce his whole life to that one moment, and that wasn't even a thing." I was kind of hoping that Olivia Chow and so. Jack Layton were doing a press conference when that came out and was like, yeah, I let Jack do that once in a while because I'm tired. <laughs> you know, I was hoping for that. Like, just the ownership of it, just to take the wind out of the sails from the post-media story. You know? uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Jen's got one when RBG died, too. Yes. That one, yeah. It's, yeah, that one, that one. That Why do I forget? Peter Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. indeed. But... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I say there that lack of class too is uh, it, it's throughout it permeates politics in the sense that, for example, when uh, we showed uh, the other day a clip of uh, uh, Brian Mulroney uh, entering the House of Commons uh, as leader and uh, how Pierre Trudeau um, greeted him, you know, when there used to be time on the first day, it was like, yes, tomorrow we will spar. But today, yeah. welcome to the club. You know, like this, tomorrow I'll take it. And, and now it's like, you know, the leadership race is like is over and the person's just been declared the confetti's still falling. And then there's a meme with someone all in red, you know, with a red hue and like this. And this person is evil. It's like, dude, man, I haven't even made it to the office yet. The confetti's still falling. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to screw up the country yet, man. Yeah. Like, chill. <laughs> so, you know, the, all these, these, these niceties that we used to have, you know, that on the first day you wouldn't strike, you would give time for someone to actually say hello and, you know, and then, and you'd say hello back and then you'd hit, like, that, all that's gone too. So it's like that whole concept of, you know, like this, gee, the, the person just died. Can we let the body get cold? It's like, no, you, you got to jump on the moment right now. Like just to, everything, it, any occasion is good to trash the other. Yeah. Uh, well, as you both know, I am a strong proponent of personal etiquette. <laughs> no, but when it when it comes to death, though, like death has the final word. You know, we're not we're, we're you know, you're not scoring any points dunking on a dead guy. You know, it just you know, and and I think it might be a good exercise for people to um, it, when someone they don't like passes away um, to, to sort of do a deep dive on them to find something that they like so they don't have to be bitter about a person posthumously like it just you know like like you used the don cherry example earlier i don't remember what the context was but if don cherry died i would be kind of sad like i i don't think he's defined by mm -hmm. those people that that comment i don't think he's defined by the half dozen other comments 
maybe we should define him on the amount of money that he gives to children's charities instead, because that seems more important to me than a throwaway line that, mm. that could be seen as controversial or even hateful. You know, like there's, uh, we all have that balance, that scale inside of us of morals and ethics where you put a rock on something negative, you put a rock on one side that makes it go down because you said something negative, but then you donate 50 grand to a children's charity. I don't know which one's more important to people, you know, like, I, like, and I'm, you know, I'm not any more knowable than in anybody else. I'm sure if you uh, search me, you can uh, find a couple of tweets every now and then where on between musical notes where I say, ding dong, the witch is dead. You, you did it so. stylishly this morning, Douglas. You said, uh, I, 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 uh, I heard he died. I'm still waiting for the soil samples. <laughs> yes, I will. I will believe it. It says the reporting Rex Murphy died. I will not believe it until I see the soil. soil Was that samples. a residential school reference? uh that's what i thought it was because accidentally the, yes yeah. i guess it was but no it was more like uh there was a i heard uh somebody it was back in the civil rights uh somebody in the civil rights time when they were talking about something and um they said uh, i'll believe it when it lasts yeah. you have the rights now so i'll believe it when it lasts so it's sort of like he's dead it's like yeah it's like i'll believe it when he's compost like <laughs> you could show yeah. me proof because <laughs> this guy is it's like <laughs> there's a comment there yeah. from christian that says this is called whitewashing what we were just talking about it's not called whitewashing it's taking no. the full picture of a person mm -hmm. well, instead we, we, of just actually, honing we, in on the negative right but actually we didn't even do that yet because we didn't even talk about him or his career all that much we just talked about the principle of people trashing someone as soon as they've died we haven't yeah. even talked about his specific legacy or what it is that he contributed yeah i mean so we haven't even like if we were whitewashing if we were whitewashing and if it wasn't our intent we haven't even like we basically would have had the bucket here and the and and the rags over the bucket over here and the rags over here but like no water yet or right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, like oh. we all we've all had uh interesting lives i'm sure dude i would never be able to leave my house if i was judged for all of the questionable things that i've done <laughs> like you know what i mean like i'd be very i would live in fear if i died and then someone opened up the pandora's box of mistakes that i've made and then th th i was just defined by that for the rest of my life or for the memory of me because you know, maybe that's what it takes. Maybe it takes a person who recognizes their own flaws to see this and get disgusted by it. Because again, I saw people that I that I respected in the digital realm, um, even journalists this morning. I'm just scrolling through and I'm like, I can't even believe like he's a commentator, guys. He's not a war general <laughs> responsible for like mass graves. Like he's he's a commentator. Um, what do you think it says about our society? Like what do you, you know? Have we always been like this? Or is social media sort of the trigger? Uh, there's this part of it that the the the, uh, the the anonymity and the lack of consequence. But I mean, it, it's this general thing. I heard. Uh, I think it was uh, David Coletto. I think he was from Abacus was talking about it, or Bruce Anderson. Something called about uh, um, effective. So affect, not effect. A f f e e c t. Affective um, seclusion right so we're not uh in polling when we're asking questions like for example would you be okay if your uh child dated if you were a liberal dated a conservative whatnot would you be okay if a conservative moved in your neighborhood or do, would you be okay if a liberal like this there's, there's a lot more polarization now a lot more people now are saying yeah that would bother me yeah, it they treat than, people than treat, it was. People treat life like a video game now. Social media yes. has made it sort of like not artificial, but not authentic either. Have you ever like uh, I I wanted to do a skit with Ryan Lindley actually. Uh, we talked about it where we take uh people who were in like Twitter flame wars and we just do a skit where we speak it instead of read it. It's hilarious. Like, <laughs> you know, there's people that are like well-meaning people that are like, oh, let me clarify from my first comment. I didn't mean I, 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 I was mistaken. It was 60, not 16, just some random example. And then you'll get 30 comments like you said 16. 
It's like, yeah, I clarified. You said 16. Like, and if you watch people talk like that in real life, it would be like, are you guys having strokes? <laughs> like, what's going on here? You know? Yeah. And I and that's a that, that's a damaging thing. I don't know if we there's a solution for that. We have to just learn in school how to communicate effectively again. There should be a social media communications course in high school or something where we teach people not to be dicks. Yeah, know? but that is again, right? All of this presumes an environment where every account that's on social media is an account held by someone like you, me, Mr. Grizzly, like people watching who actually just want to genuinely exchange on stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. There's the, the whole in the whole disinformation slash misinformation industry that has all the other accounts that are on the bots, the paid accounts, the people that are there to, if you're making a good point somewhere to try and engage you to take you off that point and remove you from a conversation so you can't stop so you can't keep on spreading information yeah. like this or it makes it look like you're in a silly war and people all those all those accounts that's there too so if we had this actual environment for example where everybody has like that was on social media was commenting with their own picture and their own name and that was it if you were a company you had one account for your company and that was it and if you couldn't prove who you were whatnot yeah that's that would be a whole lot different it would be um i i remember i i know why it's people not like just it's not just us out there no it's not and it's it's really the both sides like like it's it's interesting because we people are the, generally the same if you if you're like if you're a far right person or if you're a far left person or a moderate right or moderate left there are so there are more similarities between us than differences. Oh yeah, um, yes. you know, especially when we think that we're on the right side of an issue. Um, the negative uh, people will uh, who entrench themselves in um, that self congratulatory idea that they're right about something will behave in the exact same way as the right wing that that does the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's examples. Uh, I am sort of generalizing here, but the behavior of feeling that you're right re often results in uh, throwing daggers at people needlessly and unproductively. You know, like I didn't agree with a lot of things Rex Murphy said, but I remember when I did agree with him, it felt really good because he was so good at making points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like right. he, he, the way that he spoke, like I think it was, um, I think it was when Trudeau took office and the Saudi arms deal um uh, was happening that was like m the deal was made by the harper government and i was one of those people that was like tear it up you know and um dadder uh the cartoonist did that cartoon where um the tank rolls over uh a saudi uh woman mm -hmm. and uh trudeau's in the tank and he's like i'm a feminist yeah. and it was like it was very powerful and rex murphy i think did a if i'm remembering correctly did a monologue on that and i'm like yeah waste the billions of dollars in the few hundred jobs in order to take a principal stance against giving a theocratic regime who, who oppresses women and gay people and all the rest of it um cancel that deal fuck it you know sorry are we allowed to swear in the morning show yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely uh, absolutely it's, it's for grown-ups I'll, I'll try not to we do a show for grown-ups okay. um yay <laughs> uh, mr grizzly you had something you wanted to add earlier no i was just going to say that uh yeah. Look, I, I had loved uh, his commentary for decades, mm -hmm. as I as I mentioned earlier, and I noticed that over the last number of years, he had just kind of fallen off the rails for whatever reason. I don't know. Did I uh, dance uh, on his grave this morning? Absolutely not. You know, he had people in, who loved him. He had colleagues that cared for him. He, he had a family. I don't know if he was married, but uh, he had people who loved him, and. I don't want to put his entire life into a five-year period. That's not fair because he lived 74 years. Or was it 77? 77. 74? 77. 77. 77. Yeah. 77 years. You don't want to put 77 years into a five-year period and say that was his whole existence of who he was. Again, I'm troubled by his last few years. Prior to that, I thought he was a great commenter and a wonderful journalist. And many people will say the same. Now, there's other people who have said, no, he was always this hack as they called him. I'm like, oh, okay, if you say so, that's your opinion. I, I disagree. I think he became a hack in the last number of years, but I don't think that was his entire existence. I thought he was always a very good commenter and, and, and a great writer and, and a, 
an absolute wonderful wordsmith. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not yeah. that smart. <laughs> See, when I watched him, when I was younger, when I first saw him, like this, because he always had that, that segment on uh, the national every yes. now and then he would pop up and present the point of view. Uh, and it was just, it was the so good. Words, the words that he knew. Yes. Yeah. yes. Like, like words, uh, I'm the age that I'm at now and words are my life. But I was, I always loved words and languages and whatnot. That was, you know, I was never a math and science kind of guy. I was okay in them, but like this, but my interest, my natural interest went to languages and words and history and humanities and all that type of stuff. And to hear just the, the words coming out of his mouth and how he can make an argument and string things together. And it was just like, and back then, back in high school, I was you know, what, the, the debater too. So it's just like, wow, he's look how he's putting stuff together. It's like, mm-hmm. take some notes. Cause if you want to win a championship, you got to do it like that. Right. Um, and I often agreed with some of his views more back then and then often disagreed, you know, but I was more, uh, I leaned way more, um, or maybe I still do. And it's just all the, all the parties that have changed like this, but mm-hmm. I would have mm-hmm. identified more, uh, as I was coming into politics as an actual progressive conservative than anything else at mm-hmm. that time in my life. Um, so if he was always on that side, then yes, probably. Uh, and then, you know, life happens and your eyes open up and you know you realize you you might have been a little misguided here and there and you know you adjust um but what this were the guy views, what were his controversial views because i don't really i mean i i i well, probably could could guess but i just specifically i remember only i remember a couple of things that were controversial like apparently he was like a oil lobbyist or something like that and then was speaking uh uh, a, a, in a climate change denialism sort of context. Yeah. Well, he also said that systemic racism did not exist in Canada, which we all know to be total bullshit. It does. Yeah. It has. It's not I, I th- anytime soon. You know what it is? The right, the right have an idea about systemic racism where they define it differently than the left do. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't mean I, I've, I've spoke, I spoke to Christy Blatchford years ago about this before she mm-hmm. passed away. Um, she was my neighbor. So I used to see her all the time. And um, she's like, there's no um, understanding of like the reasonable conservative view on the history of racism and present day racism. Mm-hmm. They, it's not that they think it doesn't exist. They just, uh, you know, th- there is a belief that if you claim that an organization is systemically racist, that you need data to to establish it. You need individuals who have demonstrated this. You know, it's not about um, stats on, on uh, hey, this department has 100 people and there's only... Uh, 11 people of color well then you have to find out how many people of color applied then you have to find like it's not always like racism that's it close the door that's you know that's the end of it um and i think that because we don't talk to each other anymore we don't understand that sometimes what may sound like a totally ignorant thing to you may just be a person's thought process being different and Mm -hmm. and and not being unpacked enough for you to understand what the actual viewpoint is. And I'm not trying to throw. That's a fair statement though. No, I agree with you, James. I do. Uh, One of the, like some of the things he said, uh, uh, Rex Murphy, I miss Donald Trump and the hypnotic hold he had on his enemies. (laughs) Like, (laughs) dude, that's not a good take. And I mean, he was on stage with Tucker Carlson and Conrad, Conrad Black in Edmonton back in December. Like, yeah, but what's wrong with that though? Well, Other than the fact that you don't like them and their opinions, I don't like them either. But um, I'm just wondering. Here's what's wrong with it: okay. he, f- he was fully in their camp, fully ensconced, and fully on their side with everything they were saying. That's why I have a problem with it. He wasn't debating them; he was patting them on the back and saying, "Yes, let's go." That's what I had a problem with because guess what? They're not good people. You Most know what's funny? Of humanity knows that. Tucker Carlson was on Joe Rogan. Um, like, I don't know, a few weeks ago or a month ago or something. I swear to God, Paul, if you watch the first 45 minutes of that podcast, you would walk away thinking that Tucker Carlson was progressive. Oh yeah. Really? It's so weird. I, I know that sounds strange. I never expected mm-hmm. that, but there he's talking about like, he's basically a pacifist. He said that the biggest war crime in history, in history was dropping two nuclear bombs in Japan. You know, you never hear conservatives saying stuff like no. that ever. And I think that there's a, and they do it deliberately, right? Like Tucker Carlson's a capitalist at the end of the day. So um, he'll he'll inject some of his stronger opinions with even more steroids in order to activate the people that support him. And I and I yeah. understand that's a, that's I think it's unethical and shady. 
But there is also like a caricature that we give people where now for the rest of Tucker Carlson's life, half the population just writes him off as a white supremacist, racist, knee, uh, knee jerk reactionary conservative. And that's it. And I just don't. And I think that's our biggest problem right now. That's what gets Trump elected. That's what gets, you know, um, that's what fuels protests where violence breaks out or when bigotry breaks out on campuses because of wars that are going on the other side of the world. We don't talk to each other. And I think this is, there's like a watershed moments all the time happening, like the death of Rex Murphy, where we can actually talk about how we never talk about things because that's why shows like yours are so important. I, I hope Dean's thing with David Parker goes well. That was a, that was a, a big risk for him to fly all the way across the country to interview yes. him. Um, but you know what? It's a, more of a positive, I think, than a negative. And I think we mm -hmm. need to really sort of start embracing the fact that we are um, living in a country where half of us don't feel the same way as the other half. Mm -hmm. And instead of just pointing fingers and yelling at each other all the time, we need to sit down and actually like, you know, talk. Like we can, yeah. we can remove the fringes from either side. Mm -hmm. They can, and, and unless they want to smarten up and be more civil and be more logical and all that, they can they can leave. But that's not a big swath of our country. That's like maybe fifteen percent yes. in total, if if that, if it's even that big, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's that big. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but we did like even just the conversations we have now. Like I'm following the chat, we've already lost some people. Like it was not even being open, willing to hear just this. Mm -hmm part and nothing of what you said is controversial stretch like these are probably an actual these these are probably i know these to be actual things mm -hmm. yeah, it's nothing nothing has been caustic or controversial no no or no, 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 no no but i know these these things to be an actual thing yes there yes. are times that how many times have i had a conversation but we, just the other day we had a, a gentle i'm going to assume a gentleman going by trent something mm -hmm who started out chatting and it seemed to be maybe a little, a little more assertive than it needed to be considering that we're a friendly bunch. And it was like, yo, yo, you know, you don't need to have elbows up. Like mm -hmm. there are some house rules here. If you really have according to their house rules, express your opinion like this. We're, we're okay with it. Yeah. Yes. And we got to like, you know, thank you for letting me stay. And then another day, a couple of days ago on the show was like, you know, uh, I don't always agree with your opinion, but I appreciate the way you bring the news. Yeah. Right? So, it's... <laughs> Sorry, Saucy. <laughs> it's true, though, right? Say it for the uh, listening audience. I can treat, it from Saucy Sea Witch, I can treat someone with civility and still think they're an asshole. That's perfect. Yeah. Put, put that on my headstone. Because... <laughs> right? So, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, what you are saying is what you are saying is true like this we don't listen enough and all that kind of stuff now trying to like coming we, or however no 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 we, we we sort of strayed a bit there from rex murphy because we're you know we're talking mm. about like general sort of right stuff and right mm. and left and whatnot but as it pertains to rex murphy specifically i just like want to read a couple of things and because you know it's not necessarily um his visibility over the last couple of years, if he's only come into your public consciousness over the last couple of years, gives you the impression that he's been one one type of person all, all along. And I, I just want to read a little bit because I, I do believe in giving people their due. So according to the CBC here, uh, Rex Murphy, the controversial Newfoundland-born pundit and wordsmith whose writing and often blistering commentaries were the focus of a decades-long career in Canadian media, has died at the age of 77, according to the National Post. Also because it was according to the National Post. That's what, also one of the other reasons why I said I wanted swell samples, because... <laughs> yeah. I've just... Got to fact, fact check that, boys. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, it's just... Yeah. If, yeah, National Post, that's exactly what you'd want us to believe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's an election coming. Yeah. Sympathy vote for PP. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, picks he's or, doing his part, it, that conservative. <laughs> picks or it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> Quote, you may not agree with what Rex had to say, but boy, oh boy, could he ever say it, said comedian and fellow Newfoundlander Mark Critch, yeah. who performed an impression of Murphy on this hour as 22 minutes. Those were so great, by the they way. They were amazing. Remember you need hair? to look those up. If, yes. yes. You need to. <laughs> 
<laughs> so in the eyes, you really need to look those up, kids. If you want to pay yourself a little treat today, look up Mark Rich, Rex Murphy. This hour is twenty two minutes, and I think there was a couple of times where he appeared on it with him, right? Oh, Two. really? I, I think so, yeah. yeah, I think I think there was a couple of times he laughed at himself by appearing at the same time. That's my favorite thing when impersonators impersonate in front of the person they're impersonating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Andrew Fury posted a statement on the social platform X Thursday saying that people there, quote, are mourning one of our own tonight and sending condolences to his family and friends. Murphy's, quote, quick wit and mastery of words were unmatched and his presence was significant, whether or not everyone always agreed, Fury said, echoing a theme that Critch touched upon in his own remembrance. Critch told CBC News that, quote, he'd only known a world with Rex in it, explaining that he grew up next to a radio station where his father worked along with Murphy. Quote, as a little boy, I remember seeing this man with wild hair and a golden turtleneck listening to music with dad at the house, and he was larger than life. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, in a tribute posted on social media, remembered Murphy, quote, as one of the most intelligent and fiercely free-thinking journalists this country has ever known. In another social media tribute, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev called Murphy, quote, an icon, a pioneer of independent, eloquent, and fearless thought, and always a captivating orator who never lost his touch. Murphy graduated from the Newfoundland Memorial University before attending Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar in 1968. Mm -hmm. well, he got to start that. lending a hand at the private radio station VOCM in St. John's, backfilling a talk show while its host went on vacation. Murphy would go on to spend many years working on, with CBC, including work on both radio and television. He was a National Post columnist at the time of his death and had previously written columns for the Globe and Mail. Quote, when Rex had something to say, he knew exactly what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it. Kevin Libin, a longtime editor of Murphy's work at Post Media, told CBC News on Thursday evening. Murphy, and this is what Murphy is most well known for here, kids. Murphy hosted Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio for more than two decades mm -hmm. and was a familiar face to longtime viewers of the CBC's The National. His appearances on CBC TV date as far back as the 1970s. Cross Country Checkup still exists as a show today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but he was on that for over two decades yeah that's when his Crossing hair was at its finest yes yes <laughs> now they go into controversies and criticism murphy's work drew criticism at times including for accepting paid speaking engagements for the oil industry in 2014 while still hosting cross-country checkup and regularly contributing tv essays to the national members of the public complained to cbc's ombudsman that murphy was in a conflict of interest for doing paid speeches at oil industry gatherings Murphy had long defended the sector, including on CBC, saying the oil boom saved many of his friends and fellow Newfoundlanders from economic ruin when the East Coast fisheries collapsed. Again, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he was he was uh, a, a, a proponent of that industry before he became a paid spokesperson for that industry. So it wasn't exactly. like his opinion uh, impacted um how he accepted the job it wasn't that he accepted the job and then changed his opinion so i think right. that but if you out. saw the collapse of the fisheries you know yeah. how hard that hit yeah you can that's why i'm saying when you take time to get to know okay you know what i don't agree with you but i see how you could see it that way right yeah and you have to respect the uh individual who um doesn't care about blowback when they mm -hmm. are offering their opinion you know, I, I've got a, a small theory here I'm going to float, and you gentlemen tell me what you think about this. Uh, you noticed, um, you know, Rex, as he got older, his hair got a little bit wilder and a little bit crazier and a little bit higher, and he had a Trump or a, or, or a or what's this, what's the guy in Argentina, his haircut, and... <laughs> Javier Millet. Boris Johnson. So all the bad, evil people have the worst freaking hair <laughs> later in life. That's my evil. that's my evil. line. <laughs> that was my observation. I know, but but you know, I just like super villain. What hair. happened to Rex's hair? Maybe Rex. I don't know what happened. You know, <laughs> but but did but did he flip? Like I I just ask you because I I don't really know. Did yeah. uh, we, we're saying that in the last decade, and obviously I I noticed it not because of the contrast and difference uh, with how he was beforehand. But um, he was just, um, you know, the controversial opinions well, were coming at a time where social media was exploding and, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was more division and everything. But did he flip-flop on issues? Or, like, did we just not know until the last decade or so that he had these viewpoints because he was on CBC, right? Like, I might suggest it's probably maybe more the latter. 
Okay. Because a lot of this seemed new new to me as it was happening based yes. on what I knew of him to be true. It's like, oh man, you're taking a turn. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. in the last number of years. And, and is it now here, let me float this one for you. You will notice that elegant, eloquent writers such as Conrad Black, who has been um, isolated from the real world, real world for decades. I think Rex got into that upper echelon as well, where when they have so much money, they don't know how the rest of us actually live and they've lost touch with that part of reality and they get bitter and angry and seem to want more. Maybe that's what happened to him. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a possibility that he had been in the halls of wealth and power for so long he felt yeah. he deserved it. Maybe. I mean, I'm looking at the comments here, and and there's uh, th uh, there's a couple of them where it, it is a little confusing. Um, you know, like uh, saying that he was uh, that the money impacted his opinion. I don't. I don't think that's true. And it is also worth pointing out. I think um, that there are a whole contingent of people that feel like they were progressive ten years ago, mm -hmm. haven't changed their views. And are mm -hmm. now being labeled as conservative. So if Correct. you're a conservative 10 years ago and you haven't changed your views, you're now considered far, far right. And I think that's like the spectrum shifted, shifted more than people did, I think. Yes. Um, the window has shifted more than yes. people have done. Definitely for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, look, listen, we're still old enough to remember when carbon pricing was a conservative concept. Yes. <laughs> it's not that long ago. Can you put <laughs> Vim's comment up and let me just show my glorious scalp? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the less hair people have, the closer they are to perfect. Um, so while talking about this, later in life, according to the article, Murphy became a loud detractor of the federal liberal party despite having twice run as a provincial liberal mm -hmm. candidate in the mid-1980s. So again, yeah. you know, people saying he was always a conservative? Not necessarily. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government. But he still had liberals who admired him, such as longtime politician Bob Ray, who posted on X that while they disagreed on many things, he never, quote, lost affection and admiration for him. He loved Newfoundland and Canada and was fearless. He was also an outspoken opponent of wokeism, progressive ideology, sensitive to, sensitive to systemic inequities, and argued in his column that conservative voices like his were being pushed to the margins. Yeah. In the 2022 column, he decried, quote, the frenzy of woke politics and the cancel culture. It has bred and nourished the prescription on what may or may not be debated or talked about. Two years later, he had been at the center of one such frenzy for another piece of writing in the National Post. A week after Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd, a black man, Murphy accused liberals, both in general and in the party, of trumping up racism in Canada. Quote, most Canadians, the vast majority, in fact, are horrified by racism and would never participate in it, he wrote. We are, in fact, not a racist country, though to say so may shock some. The column was widely decried, prompting an editorial review at the Post, which eventually added a note at the top of the piece saying it fell short of the newspaper standards. Um, well, I mean, he's a white man in a position of power saying uh, racism isn't really a thing. I'm like, oh, really? Why don't you ask somebody mm -hmm. who's been on the receiving end of it then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's and that. There's diversity of opinion inside people of color too, though. Yes, there's, absolutely. There's people that agree. There's, there's black people that agree with Rex Murphy. Yeah. You know, and that, that's what I'm saying about the nuanced perspectives that we never talk about anymore. You know, and then yeah. and I think it's hugely important, especially now. Yeah, he's um, also Mark Critch mentioned uh, when he was talking about him uh, that uh, as much as he uh, has been a stalwart anti Justin Trudeau. Um, Rex also believed that Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau was one of the greatest Canadians that had ever lived. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> strange contrast there. So he's not friends with Stephen Harper. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? See, that's an, that, that's a great example. That's a good example. That's mm -hmm. a good example of the of of someone on the right trashing a progressive person on the day they died when Stephen Harper put out his one thousand word. Uh, admonishing uh pierre elliott trudeau literally on the day that he died yeah, yeah. i don't know if you remember that but that yeah. was that was especially kind of heinous like you know and if stephen harper died tomorrow like listen like we, we should save this kind of vitriol See, for, for that's people what i'm like saying Putin, you know like i know but that's what i'm saying like you know what if stephen harper were to pass away I cannot guarantee that there would not be a ding dong, which is dead tweet for me. <laughs> for 
for you. I, I cannot guarantee. But like you said, when I heard that Rex Murphy passed away, that, that thought never crossed my mind whatsoever. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's almost like an end of an era in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We well, need to save our vitriol, I think, for world leaders a little bit different because they are in that position where their decisions impact lives. Um, you know, and, and some of it is life or death, these issues that they, like if Stephen Harper was prime minister when the Iraq war broke out, we would have been in Iraq for 10 years or whatever it is, you know? So, um, they, you get a pass for, for trashing world leaders when they die, I think, um, especially if they're in power, Jack Layton, I, I wouldn't include in that cause he never was our prime minister, but the, um, you know, we should really be saving it for, for Putin, you know, for, for, for people like that, for ne- I'll say it, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, you know, these are individuals that deserve to sort of be chastised till the end of time, I think. Um, but I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're going to see a, 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 a sort of organic correction in how we think, because eventually we're going to get to an, a, a stage in our nation's history where um, very famous people are, are like, especially boomers are going to be dying on a regular basis, like celebrities did in 2017 or whatever that yes. was. Remember that one year? That was crazy. Yeah. But, you know, people from different sides of the political spectrum are going to start dropping like flies like that. And it's either we're, we're either not going to notice our hypocrisy or we will, you know, like we don't want someone to trash our guy when they die, but we'll happily trash their guy. And I think that maybe if we see that pronounced and, and on a regular basis, maybe we can do something that corrects it. I, I think I'm being a little idealistic. You know, I don't know how to put the genie back in the bottle when it comes to the social media snark, but there's part of me that says, you know, on that one, we really can't. We just need to be better at identifying, you know, you know, oh wait a minute. Yeah, this is bait. Yeah. There's yeah. their tweet you you can tell what like, this just by just the way they're written or just by how hyperbolic or strident or whatnot they are, just how casually uh, you know, we're pointing out who we who we're, who we're hating today. You know, resonates in that tweet. Uh, it's just like this is bait, or yeah. something so so obviously, um, s- something so obviously wrong or stupid that it's like you know, like so, the world is flat. Prove me wrong. I can't believe you believe the world is flat. My God, where are you students? It's just like <laughs> thank you for the engagement. Ching ching. Let the, Have a nice day. Yeah, let Giants used in. to roam the earth. Okay, <laughs> but I mean, it's well. That's that, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying when I'm saying things like, like on social media. There's not just only us, mm-hmm. like this. And we could sit there and we can turn around and say, "Oh my God, they need to stop that." Because they're probably not going to stop that because it's not in the financial interest. So that we have to get better at saying, "Oh yeah, that's bait." I I retweeted a guy this morning that said, I'll say this about Rex Murphy. The guy who I studied and revered in journalism Mm -hmm. school isn't the same guy who lived the last years of his life as a bitter, petty, and embarrassing stain on Canadian media. The guy who wrote that on the day that Rex Murphy died is calling Rex Murphy petty. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, and I'm not gonna, I I don't necessarily disagree with the statement, but it's like, dude, um, pot, kettle introduce yourselves <laughs> like, yeah it's you're a, accusing yeah. somebody of being petty while being petty it's kind of uh, rule number one of social media if you're going to accuse somebody of something being something you have to be less of that than they are yes. yeah as you are doing it let's yeah. uh let's move off of rex if we could because i've 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 kind of I'm tiring of Rex, to be honest with you. <laughs> and there are other things we need to get to. And I want to just drop this in here for you. This is the Theo Madakis' latest uh, political cartoon. Political? I don't know if you want to call it. I'm just going to put this on the screen so we can have a look at it. And I think this sums it up nicely. Don't you? Yes, it does. I think it absolutely, absolutely does. Uh, because for the first time ever, <laughs> we have... Women's playoff hockey in Toronto, and there's they're, and they're the favorite, they're the first place team. They're they're favored to win the uh, what is it the the Walter Cup? 
Oh, I think it's the Walter Cup. They yeah, are favored to win, like that, though. Yes. Uh, so the, the the political cartoon for those of you who are listening is a picture of a guy throwing a Leafs uh, sweater in the garbage, and then a Blue Jays jersey in the garbage, and then he puts on a Toronto uh, women's professional women's hockey league team sweater and says women's hockey the perfect remedy for the toronto sports fan <laughs> uh, are, i'm asking this not to be um uh, a dick about it i'm just wondering are they selling tickets like yes. are, 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 are they are they getting good crowds oh yes, yes. because whenever like i hear about crowds. whenever i hear in the states whenever people say like, why does uh, the WNBA women not make as much as the men it's like because no well, one they goes don't goddamn games like you, yeah. you know so i'm hopeful that uh that it's like remember the lacrosse team in toronto was getting more fans than the jays were at one point yes the <laughs> toronto ago. rock no but the uh, women's hockey uh, the most of the games are sellouts uh i've and i was um i attended one here recently in ottawa and they uh i think there were 80 people short of a total sellout wow and that was a wednesday night where the senators mm-hmm. play no 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 oh. at uh, at uh, td place so, so yeah. eight just under eight thousand people that's great. But they have, they, yeah. they, but they have sold out uh, the Bell uh, Bell Center in Montreal every now and then. Yes. they'll have a couple. They'll have a like match. Twenty one thousand people. And they have as well. Do they fight? The, uh, no fighting. No. No. They would sell ten. There is contact. If they allowed them to fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, sold twenty one thousand. I'm just saying. Uh, but uh, so yes, we have a playoff hockey. Uh, Toronto is up one zero. Montreal is down zero one. Uh, but also. Um, CB Sports, CBC Sports has learned that Kilmer Sports Incorporated, headed by Toronto billionaire Larry Tannenbaum, has been granted an expansion franchise with the Women's National Basketball mm-hmm. Association. Thank you very much. The WNBA. We're getting a team. Now going to, getting yes. a team in Toronto. Oh, that's starting awesome. to begin to, to begin play in March 2026. An announcement is expected. Official announcement expected May 23rd in Toronto. But uh, by I want to name the team. I want to name the team. El- my only issue is okay. We'll get to that. My only issue is I'm sitting there going like this. Tannenbaum is the minority owner and chairman of sporting giant Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Maple Leafs, Raptors, TFC, Argos, and Marlies. Do they really need to give another sports team? Can we switch it up? Can we mm-hmm. put a little new blood into the family? Well, if you want a budget for people, are starting to ask questions yeah. about the kids. Here, here's the thing, though. It's like I'm literally, if, if you want the, the the franchise to succeed. That's the that's the corporation and the company and the guy to do it. I mean, look what he did with the Raptors. Well, the Raptors when the Raptors first came out, and I was a diehard. I, I still am a basketball fan. I was a Knicks fan, and then the Raptors came out, and I'm like, this is awesome. But they launched with the worst branding ever mm-hmm. because uh, two things were popular when the Raptors came out: Jurassic Park and yeah. Barney, the yes. children's dinosaur. So they went and their per- logo looked like Barney had rabies or something yeah. right like and and um they then then when we the north when they totally changed their branding to we the north that's when they finally like players were like i'm not playing for toronto back yeah. in the day you yeah. know people that were traded here were like saying no nah, i'm not gonna go there and then you know and then it, then it vastly improved so i'm hopeful well, it changed with with uh vince carter yeah yeah. That was that was the tide that turned the team around. He also did you know that Vince Carter, um, and his his um, he changed uh, fundamentally changed society in the province of Ontario. Bottle service was not a thing before Vince Carter. Really, literally was not a thing in the province of Ontario before Vince Carter. Vince Carter actually got his lawyer to lobby the government to find ways to make it work because when NBA teams would come to Toronto, they'd go to a club afterwards. And they wanted bottle service. Well, that didn't exist. So I kind of hate bottle service. So now I know, I know, but he changed it. He literally changed it. And his lawyer fought and lobbied to get the laws augmented so that they could have bottle service because there was no reason to not have it. And they couldn't present a, a cogent argument to say, well, this is why you can't. It's like, what? So I can have a bottle brought to my table or I can just go back to the bar 40 times. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ontario, that was probably one of those nanny state things that Ontario was. was famous for. Yeah. You also have to yeah. remember at the time, the bars closed at 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. I remember going to visit people in Toronto and 9 o'clock, we got to get to the club. I'm like, it's 9 o'clock. Why are we going out so bloody early? They're like, well, we don't go there now. We won't get in. I'm just, I'm like, what? They come to yeah. visit me and we wouldn't go out till 10, 30 or 11. They go, why? Wow, everything closed. I go, we have Hull. That's open till 3. <laughs> So we can go out for an hour in Ottawa and then cross the bridge and go out for two more hours. Yeah. 
Yeah. A source said that the, the new team will play at the Coca-Cola Coliseum, an 8,000-seat arena at Toronto Scenic Marlies. Grounds, yeah. which is home to the Marlies, where the Toronto Professional Women's Hockey League franchise is currently playing its playoff series. Professional Women's Sports has been on the rise in Canada as the formation of the PWHL that has the other two Canadian franchises in Ottawa and Montreal, as well as a new women's soccer league that is expected to begin play in 2025. A year ago, Toronto Scotiabank Arena sold out for the WNBA's first preseason game in Canada, and on Saturday, more than 16,000 tickets were sold for a game in Edmonton's Rogers Place. So uh, hopefully there is lots of demand for this product. Do they know the it's, name? Do no, they say not. what the name is? No, they did not say yet. No, that'll so probably I, happen on the 23rd if there is a name. I once um, did an on-the-spot uh just random pitch to Tannenbaum when I saw him at the TD center once <laughs> because oh, yeah. I wanted to change. This is before we, the North, I wanted to change the name of the Raptors, but this, the, the women's team would be, would work too. I think that the Toronto basketball team should be called the Toronto streets because it's abstract, yeah. right? Like you're the marketing that you could do with that. It, it, it is crazy. You get the urban demographic and the hip hop crowd and everything supporting it. It, it would be, the logo would be dope. Um, and and I pitched that to Tannenbaum, and he he looks at me like this, and he's like, "I'm sorry, who are you?" And I'm like, "I'm James." <laughs> he's like, "So you want to change the name of my franchise to the Toronto Streets?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And he sat there like this, and he's like, "Good name, but I'll never do it." <laughs> I'm just like, "Okay, well, maybe now you can do the win." If he does that now, do I get money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you better call him. Yeah, I you better call him. him. I'm pretty <laughs> sure the branding's already done. You know, <laughs> so there it goes like, yes, I know. Let's call it streets. That sounds great. Where'd you hear that? I don't know. I heard it somewhere. It's like ding That's dong, true. me, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was me. <laughs> well, it's something that uh, one somebody, uh, one of the guys, one of the conservative uh, gentlemen in my Scotch and Cigar Club, who's been a. a, a an admitted lifelong conservative who's been voting NDP the last few years because he's like, I didn't leave the conservative party. The conservative party left me, yeah. which is what Charles Adler has also said. Uh, one of the gentlemen in, in, in that said, he goes, I, I, you know, when they, they talk about why aren't women in the WNBA getting paid the same as the men? And he's like, well, they don't have a television contract. Number one, a big television contract. Number one, number two, there's nobody in the stands. Yeah. So, all these, you know, uh, progressive women that will come forward and say they should be paid the same. It's like, yeah, well, then buy Oprah, season tickets, Oprah, yeah. put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And, and I'm just using Oprah as an example because she's a billionaire, but he's like, there are a lot of very wealthy women in the United States that are demanding they get paid the same. Well, put your money where your mouth is, buy some season, season tickets, invest in the program, buy a team, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, or, or I, if you, or if you yeah, have a you? big, pro if you have a big problem with the fact that they don't get paid much, buy tickets to go buy to the tickets. game. Yeah. Like, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it's an interesting. That was one of those low hanging fruit um, yeah. points that people would often make that ma never made any sense. And then if you said what you, Paul and I just said, um, like I'm talking, like uh, remember when political correctness was at its peak in like 2017, 2018, like where it was like you really like it. It was the favorite co topic of conversation among lefties was to not say this, don't say that, don't say this, don't say that, you know. And that was one of the things like you people would get entrapped in the conversations about the disparity between men and women's salaries in sports. Mm -hmm. And if you said what we just said, people would be like, it's toxic masculinity. And it's like no, it's basic economics like it's a simple fact right look look at tennis mm -hmm. serena williams gets paid um whatever her market value is and she gets paid most more than most of the men right she's like one of the greatest tennis players of all time Period. and then when they and then there's that john mcenroe thing and then serena saved john yeah. mcenroe do you remember that mm -hmm. yep. yeah so it's anyways um yeah I, i'm I think women's sports are going to be um, a big thing over the next decade. I think they're, it's going to grow. Yes. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in that WNBA team. I think it's going to be dope. Well, and, and I can tell you as somebody who has attended a women's uh, professional hockey league game, it's good hockey. It's really good hockey. And the fans are into it. I mean, the, everybody that is there is into it. And it's not. And I looked around the stadium and it, it was probably maybe a 50-50 split, male-female. And I, I'm just using those as gender binary terms. Don't anybody get upset, please. But say, uh, of somebody who would present as male and somebody who would present as female, if you just look at them, uh, about a 50-50 split. 
And the dudes were into the men. Sorry, dude is not a non-gender bias term anymore. The, the oh, men stop. were into it <laughs> just as much as the women. Yeah. And in some cases, guys were like just freaking out. I'm like, so good, a, a good product on the ice will put butts in seats, period. And it's a good product. And the reason why we pay athletes millions and teachers a pittance is because teachers get paid with public money and athletes get paid based on the market value of the franchise that they play for. So, and, you know, when people go on about, well, why is it, why? It's disgusting how much money they're paying him. I go, if the ownership can afford to pay it, do you know how much they're making? Yeah. Yeah. And they were ripping off athletes for oh God. a long time, you know. For decades. Yeah. Gordy Howe was never paid what he was worth. No. Never. Dude, Michael Jordan, what, like he, forget endorsements for a second, just his NBA salary. He wasn't even the top play, paid player no. in the league until the last couple of years he was in Chicago. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, he, uh, he makes all his money on his, his Air Jordans. Yeah. Something like $480 million a year is. Oh, my is God. What he Dude, costs. every single NBA player has the Jordan Jumpman logo on their uniform. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He actually, like Magic and Bird, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if we're going off topic here for a second, but like no, Magic, Magic and Bird helped rejuvenate the yes, NBA. They really did. But when Jordan came, yeah. billions and billions and billions of dollars have been generated just because of Michael Jordan. He made people want to watch. He mm -hmm. made, Dude, I, I used to get, I, I own five pair of Air Jordans because of my midlife crisis. But when I was a kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to get a shot of adrenaline when I would see uh, a Michael Jordan poster or his shoes or something like that. It was just, you know, he, he was a transformational athlete and, and basically the economics that are attached to him are staggering, you know? So there's a reason why we pay athletes millions of dollars. It, it seems obviously um, grotesque how much money they make. Like Otani's making, he got a $700 million deal, you know, because he's a pitcher and a hitter yes. and, you know, but, that's the market, you know, like the, the owners are not going to pay people more than their market value. You know, they're not going to do that. So it's just that we live in a crazy world where beers are $25 and tickets are $400. So, yeah. 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 And, and it, you know, I remember a few years back, must be, oh goodness, 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know if I told this story, but I'll tell it now real quick. Uh, 10 years ago, I had tickets to a game, to a sense game and uh, brought my dad along. My dad says, I'll get the first round. I go, okay. So we walk up. Thank you, babe. We walk up to the the, the vendor and uh, my dad goes, two Coors Light, two big ones. <laughs> he puts a $20 bill down and the guy goes, um, sir, that's not enough money. What? <laughs> I'm like, dad, they're 12 bucks each. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Is there now a stripper they're... that will deliver it to me? You know. <laughs> <laughs> now they're about 14 or 16. It depends on the beer, but there's, I mean, it's now that here's the thing though. Um, that people need to understand. And I know that the, the beer costs are astronomically high. That's not up for debate, but you have to consider the costs to operate a business. And I'll give you a, for instance, left hand, it's pump. If I told you what they paid in rent on a monthly basis, you would vomit. Yeah. The reason beer is $12 each because they buy it, the draft in bulk, it costs them probably 15 to 20 cents per glass for the product to put in front of you. And then they go, well, that's a massive profit margin. And I go, yeah, but they make nothing on food. And then there's all the bills along with their astronomical rent. It has to be that high in order for them to just eke out a three to 4% profit margin overall. And I've explained this to people and they, they go, oh, I, I didn't, I'm like, no, you don't know the economics of how it works. So yeah, it's complex, com convoluted, complicated. And yeah. Now in the case of beer being that expensive at an arena, well, the, the owner owns the rink <laughs> and each stall he rents to people. So he's making money no matter what. Yeah. Anyway, let's move along. Okay. Shall we? Um, you just sent me a clip, sir. Yes, I sent you a clip. Uh, we were talking uh, yesterday, I believe it was, about uh, MC Homo Milk yes. on El Beerson, uh, bringing up the subject of uh, abortion again, or in his case, uh, expanded protections for the preborn. And uh, we didn't uh, have anything um, 
we didn't have the clip from him specifically. We had another clip, but I want you to hear what it is that he did say uh, on the show. Uh, before we do that, um, we're going to uh, at some point uh, be losing James in the next few minutes. So just in case there's stuff going on when you have to go. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm so happy you. that I get to escape after ta- after making a comment or two about abortions. So that's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I All right, hey. I'm not here. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> All right, so uh, let's see what uh, Arnold had to say because uh, it's been a big week for abortion in Canada. You think? That's a funny sentence. (laughs) It is a funny sentence. All right. We saw this just the other day, but it was picked apart. Today we're going to watch it in its entirety, and here we go. Uh, The Honorable Member of Peace River, Westlock. Well, thank you, Uh, Mr. Chair, and I want to... present a petition today signed by Canadians from across the country. Uh, these Canadians are concerned about the nearly 100,000 preborn children who die every year uh, since the Morgenthaler decision. Canada is only one of two uh, nations in the world that have zero uh, laws protecting the preborn. Uh, uh, they, they also note that a uh, child's heartbeat begins when the child is uh, six weeks old and they are calling on the government of Canada and this place to strengthen the protections for the preborn in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member of Peace at River. Uh, okay, preborn. Preborn. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now, as is the case for Miss May, we mentioned yesterday, mm-hmm. about NATO, this is also just an MP doing his job of having to read into the record a petition that he got that expresses a view that is unpopular, except that in the case of NATO, I'm not particularly sure that Miss May personally believes that we need to withdraw from NATO, whereas in this case, I have no doubt in believing that Mr. Rearson would like expanded protections personally for the preborn. Well, he, he, he has, has seven children. And he's had 22 of these. And is 38. Yeah, no, 22 times he's had something right along these lines that he's oh, read yes. in the Oh, yes, that he's read into, but... He's 38 and has 17 children. Seven 17? Children. No, seven. 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 Oh, Jesus. Seven? seven Still. Yes. Seven, right? Like, no. But, oh, so well, he's got to create, he's got to create new human, uh, capital fruitful and multiply for the future. Right. right? Yeah. Um, then, uh, the other day, um, uh, we had this little event. Whoops. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, I sent you something, but it was the same thing that I just sent you. Well, that won't help. Yeah. <laughs> That's really... I, this is what real. you want. I have I have it right here. Just bear with me and I'll blow it up. And I it don't the think you'll know. Okay. If you guess. It, it was... It Let's was, see what you yeah. think I wanted. I think, I think it was this, or... Uh... Nope, but we could do, we could go there too. Okay, I was right? I was guessing breaking pro life yeah. rally on Parliament Hill from our, our friend Mark Garrison. Last week, Pierre Polyev commits to using notwithstanding clause. This week, MP start bringing forward petitions in favor of banning abortion. Now, a rally on poor Parliament Hill celebrates those conservative MPs. Now, let's be clear about something here because I think the way Mark uh, worded this. Oh, there's Arnold in the photo too. Yeah, I think it was the way Mark, yes, he is, he's right there. I think the way Mark worded this was a little duplicitous, and here's why I'll say that. This life rally or pro-life rally or whatever it is uh, that they held, uh, they hold this every year at this time. This mm-hmm. is an annual thing. Annual that March for Life. Yes, thank you. So the way he worded it, I thought was duplicitous, and I'm calling you out on that one, Mark, because you made it look like, and I don't like, I don't care for that type of politics. You painted the picture of, they did this, they, you know, these three things come together, except this, this rally is this walk, this March for life. They do this every year at this time. Yeah. Just like so, a national trans international trans day of visibility. Right. That now, happens to fall on Easter this year happens. Right. The That's the greatest year. irony, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> for, for religious people. <laughs> well, and, and again, now I, I say the way he paints it, it looks like it was all planned and designed for this yeah now, here's the thing it could very well have been it could very well have been 
right? They knew the they knew the life rally was gonna uh, was oh. gonna take place, and you know it that's is. why he read his petition, and that's why it's not yeah, standing. Yeah, no, that, that is that that's just has been the guy that made the sausage. But I can yes. tell you, yes, that's that that specifically, like all the specific dates and marches, and whatnot, like this, mm-hmm. are all on the calendar somewhere, like this. You know where they well, are. We events, have this thing yeah. like this. Okay, we could announce it now, but let's announce it in three weeks to coordinate yes. with this day. This happens right. all the time. This is, so I just didn't care for the way he painted the picture in that one. Uh, I thought it was a little duplicitous. Again, but what he's saying isn't necessarily incorrect, right? Was it a plot? Was it all put together and organized? It could have been, but yeah. it, you could just, just call that good PR, though. You know, well that too. It's, yeah. it's PR. It's, it's how you yeah. play the game. That's it's, why it, I was it is funny how the same people that believe in zombie Jesus don't believe that trans people exist. That's that's one of the greatest things ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, so this is a, an, an annual anti-abortion rally that prepare, that happens on the Hill, as we mentioned. Uh, now, the interesting part about this is that um, a statement from Pierre Polyev Sebastian Skamsky, again, notice that we never hear it from Pierre Polyev's lips himself in response to uh, Marcy Ian comments, Marcy Ian's comments. Now, Marcy Ian is the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth. And she said, are we fear mongering? Unequivocally, no. It wasn't too long ago in this country that abortion was a crime. So it's not too much to say that this is the slope we could be going down, she said Wednesday. And, uh, well, Skamsky said, these outlandish claims showed the true desperation of Justin Trudeau and his flailing liberals. A common sense conservative government will not legislate on abortion and therefore would never use this section of the Constitution pertaining to this matter, Skamsky wrote. A conservative government will only use the notwithstanding clause on matters of criminal justice. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, if you believe that, I have some beautiful ocean property off the north coast of Alberta and Saskatchewan to sell you. Mm-hmm. Step right up. Make me an offer. This is the granddaddy of polarizing issues. Yes, it is yes. the king of the castle, the queen of the castle, if you will. But I don't. I, but I don't want to talk about. No, no, that, we don't have I to. Want to talk, I, I yeah. want to talk about in the sense that you're sitting there because do we really believe that a man who, in order to change the channel from his roadside roadside stop, mm-hmm. went to the Canadian Association of Police and said, "Hey." Make me prime minister. And you know those bail, those parole issues that you have? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All constitutionally, (laughs) wink, wink, nudge, nudge, make those go away. And then come around and say, oh, but I wouldn't use that on abortion. Sure you would. Well, and and let's not When he leads a party uh... that has like more than half of his MPs vote on backbench backbench motions to restrict somehow choice really well and, and I, they're trying to backdoor it right they're trying to backdoor it i, I mean, will do anything for love but i won't do that <laughs> really remember, remember what's in they, that meatloaf jesus they, when nope. well when they brought forth legislation they tabled a bill uh, no it wasn't even a bill they, they were trying to get it to become a bill to um protect pregnant women i'm like yeah, we already have a ton of laws that do that right now <laughs> Yeah, harsher penalties. If you were, it was built to impose harsher penalties if uh, you had hurt a pregnant woman because there was a fetus in rights of the child. So it was basically a backdoor way to try to yes. establish the concept of fetal rights. But you yes. know what? You know what sucks though is that we can't. Like I, I'm pro-choice. I, I obviously um, trying to force women to give birth is a ludicrous proposition. Mm-hmm. So let's just get that out of the way. But if if a man stabs a woman to death and she's pregnant and the baby dies, we are so caught in abortion politics that it's impossible to put a law in the books that says that's a double homicide. No, you know it's I mean? it's not that it's not that it's that it's considered an aggravating factor mm-hmm. in the original crime. But I mean, it it would be considered it would be abhorrent like this. But I mean, it's not. We don't need to start creating special new crimes or whatnot. That saying was like. If you attack, especially, it, and this is the case, like if you attack someone who happens to be pregnant, that's one thing. If you're attacking someone because they are pregnant, mm-hmm. I'm just saying, if she, if the baby dies life. inside the mom, I think that's murder. If the mom wants to have this baby and she's looking forward to it, the nursery set up, she loves it, she hugs her belly at night because of it, and then someone mm-hmm. kills that baby, I think that's murder. And but abortion politics is is 
very complex and I get it. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, Douglas, I would like to hear actually both of your opinion on the, um, cause I get, conf I, I don't know where I land on this, but the, the lack of debate and the lack of enshrined laws surrounding abortion um, often is viewed by progressives as what is saving it from um, yes. being curtailed. I don't know if I agree with that necessarily. I think that if you finally like have the debate, because I think the majority of this country would be absolutely in favor of pro-choice and enshrined it as an actual right, um, maybe even have a constitutional crisis intentionally in order to get that done. Wouldn't that solve all? Because every time an election comes, there's more, uh, you know, there's fears about conservatives getting in and curbing rights and all that kind of stuff. Wouldn't that solve that problem if we had the debate, enshrined it as a right, and then moved on? Well, I personally believe that we should do like France did and, and, and enshrine it in the Constitution as a right. That would make it much, uh, much more protected. And I guess some people would say that at that point legally, then if it was enshrined as a constitutional right, then maybe you could have some laws because you have that overall arching protection, but constitutions can also be changed. It's harder, but yeah. can. So the uh, the Canadian principle of considering it strictly health care like this, and it's regulated as a health care procedure, and that it's we leave that we leave that to medical bodies and whatnot to determine rather Doctor than politicians. And patient. Yes, is uh, I'm personally okay with that, but I do because I, I do see. I do see the point where, so where you said, if we had something concrete, then we would all stop talking about it. But human nature, I believe, is such that there's always going to be somebody who will want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably mm -hmm. be me. Linda then says, if, creates if, the opening. if you make a law, the law can be repealed by a future government. You right. know, the pro-life crowd is a little self-defeating often, though, because they they make a religious argument, yeah. and they immediately lose so many of us when they make it. Like, oh, yeah. I'm actually very sensitive to the idea that if you if you believe that um, a, a baby inside a woman's womb is a life worth protecting and and you view abortion as ending a life that could have been saved, I'm sympathetic to that position. You know, I'm still pro-choice, but I, I yeah. understand that. Yeah. Louis C.K. had a funny, <laughs> funny bit um, where he's like, uh, abortion is exactly like killing babies, but women should have the right to do it. So like, yeah, I mean... Not worded sensitively, but no. it's still, you know, I, I agree with that. I, I, and I became, I'm pro-life when it comes to my own kids. Of course. Like we mourned the two miscarriages that my ex and I, obviously my ex went through more than I did, <laughs> obviously, but yes. but we still mourned, right? Oh yeah, we, absolutely. Because we, we felt, and I still feel this way, that a life was lost. So legal definitions um, and, and trying to balance that with how you feel in your soul about about this yeah. issue is very difficult. So, uh, well, you know, especially with law, right? Because remember, not everything that's lawful, there are lots of things that are lawful that are awful. Mm -hmm. Right. So there, the thing with, the, with laws, people that are making laws are always looking at the entire forest and not just the tree. So when we're talking about abortion, or like, for example, that law, you know, if you kill like this, it's you know, two lives have been taken like this. And, if that if the if that child if the birth of that child was wanted this and the mother the expectant mother wanted that child yet the way that you explained it then it's it, it's two deaths i would agree with you it's funny but, how one but, thing has but, multiple definitions based on how you feel about it not because yeah, of what it exactly is exactly how you feel but mm -hmm. again when you step step away from the tree and then look at the entire forest the judicial debate is like okay but if we write something there what are the unintended consequences if we game that out? We put this law, what can happen? This and then so and that's when you look, it's like, okay, well, can we deal with that as an aggravating factor in some way, or can we deal with that in, in another way than actually creating a law, creating a, a a way for a wedge to be inserted? So people are always balancing balancing that out. So it's it's just whether or not you're going to, you know, look at the pixel or look at the entire screen. Mm -hmm. when you have these debates and when you have these debates this is what an important media literacy to know is that some people will want to zoom in as close as possible to a certain thing and make that the entire because if you pull out like this it actually doesn't help them and then there's some people that really do want to pull out because if you have to zoom in it doesn't help them so it's yeah. how you frame these debates as well that matters so it's totally. like things for example like picking time when you when and when and when you're going to start and stop time 
like that's when you're making it an argument, what frame of time you're going to consider. Well, maybe if you made it broader, it wouldn't help your argument. Maybe if you, so these types of things, how close in you, how close in, how broadly you speak of things, all of these matter. But these yeah. laws, when, when they're being discussed, it's not just their impact on the people during that moment of criminality, but it's how does that, how can that existence, the existence of that law be then used in other court cases to challenge other things too? That also comes up and that has to be a consideration. And, and to your point, um, cause I think that's a great point. When we do frame it, like when pro-life does frame it around religion, uh, it's an, it's a non-starter, right? Like it's, yeah. it's not, that it has nothing to do with it. Um, when pro-choice, um, very steadfastly make an argument that it's not a living thing if it's still inside the mom if anyone's ever had children and have hugged their wife's womb <laughs> when, when yeah. she's pregnant that's obviously a non-starter for a lot of people as well and so and that's you know, why we, that's why the debates over the years have moved to things like viability right, right. and now and kids are born sometimes at five months instead of nine right like so right. There is but, a, but that's and that's where you get things like for example where the right has also tried things like well okay well it's not working on religious like how about let's ban abortions sex selected sex selective abortions yeah right and we're, we're sitting there with like and you're saying okay but let's game that out again right it's like oh i'm pregnant yay doctors is it a boy or a girl it's a girl oh darn i want that aborted and if the we doctor need more would turn people- around and say yes we have a low birth rate. We have a low birth rate. Has anyone ever conceptualized an idea of like uh, giving women the option to like, um, like, like abort? Uh, if you if you were going to have an abortion, to actually manly man food <laughs> made Sorry. by made by oh. a woman. Okay. Woo-hoo. Why don't you just abort my whole argument? No, I don't even know what you're talking about, James. <laughs> honestly. Okay, you're too you're too close to the mic. You're too loud. Yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on right now. <laughs> I forget what I was saying, but it was uh... something wankery. <laughs> so yeah, I'm. Um, I'm sorry. I, don't, I, didn't, I, don't know I wasn't what... following. I was just cooking. Okay. Is it okay if I come in? Sure. <laughs> What do you want to say? All right, I, I don't. I don't know where we were. Sorry. Oh, Douglas, catch me up. What are, What are we talking about? Oh, adoption. I just was thinking, like, if there was a government sponsored program where, because we have a low birth rate, to like to like give women a viable option of of having that baby for adoption. I, we don't focus on that now. And I'm not saying it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'm just wondering if anyone's ever conceptualized that at a governmental level. That's all. You know, I, that's a really good point. And I don't know, I mean, Douglas and I have had really good conversations around uh, births and, um, um, yeah, having babies and stuff. I've had two. I've had none, and I never will. Well, no, actually, you do have a baby. A dog, but I didn't give birth to her. But And James, I know you're like a super, super committed father. I really respect that. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's... Uh, did I say something controversial? Because Jen is like, I can't even. Did I do something wrong? I don't know. I, don't I, wasn't, know if... fo- I wasn't following, so I'm not really sure. It might be okay. something. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I know as, like, uh, as one half of a... A same-sex male couple that if mm-hmm. there were that type of registry that would be very 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 helpful well i have i have, welcome but yeah. i don't know if that exists or not i don't know i have um two really good friends two 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 uh super awesome dudes who uh they had a a child um they you know I, i'm sorry I'm, I'm forgetting the um the word but they had a sorry because i do have a concussion <laughs> Um, from the damn dog. Um, when you have a baby, um, when you hire someone to have a baby for you, yeah, surrogacy, surrogacy. Thank you. Um, and they have the most beautiful daughter. Oh, she's so sweet. And they're like, like they, you know, they have means. Like they're both uh, in the medical field, and they, uh found their daughter through uh, a surrogacy in the United States and flew down and picked her up. And uh, I think surrogacy is like a, a real graceful thing to do. Right. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm glad you said it. Cause now 
the the comments will attack you instead of me. I don't know what I said that was wrong, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bow out now. I was just trying to find a solution. That's all. Um, floating it's ideas fine. about saving a life. That's sorry. no, no. I mean, I mean, honestly, I I had to tap out for a bit because I was doing some work, and um, I am actually uh, I'm not late yet, but I will be uh, for yeah, a meeting. Need coffee. No, I'll be fine. It's only like two blocks away. But oh. I think surrogacy is a beautiful thing to do. Yeah. And uh, there are women who, uh, like, I couldn't do it. I could not have a baby inside me and 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 uh, and then hand that baby over. But I really respect um, women who can do that. Like, and I really hope that uh, that comes through for Douglas and anyone else who wants it like it's like like honestly you grow this person in your body for nine months or in my case nine and a half <laughs> that's not uncommon it's not uncommon i was a late baby too honestly and so when i all i got a goodness. sorry guys sorry to cut you up Bridget. i got to split i got to call my kids um, yeah call your kids your thank kids, you for kids. letting me crash your podcast today gentlemen I appreciate all right it. nice Thanks to see you helping. james as always i love you saucy sea witch I love saucy. Be nice. More. Play I nice. Love, I love saucy more. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. But um, yeah, Fair like enough. I honestly, right. we'll see I could not do, I could not um, do surrogacy, but I really appreciate people who do. Yeah, indeed. I agree with you. And uh, with you. the beautiful fathers that they are like they're just so they're like absolutely devoted to her like it's amazing they would do anything yep yep, yep. yeah we, okay. we feel we feel it would be the same way over here so mm. hopefully one day you tell. hopefully one day yep. well all right i'm taking the mic back all right that's all i got to say oh. okay bye <laughs> All right, kids and cubs. Uh, so yeah, uh, when we're talking about uh, this issue, um, right, we have uh, Pierre saying that he's going to trample rights, and then he starts asking questions as these uh, events sort of seem to all coincide or seem to be scheduled to, to try and create a narrative. And uh, now uh, he is expecting us to believe that he would not use the notwithstanding clause on things like abortion. I'm guessing by extension, he probably means other morality things like same sex marriage and that type of stuff. But, um, well, it kind of lies a lot. So, <laughs> uh, I don't believe it. Now there's another event when we're talking about things corresponding and that's why, uh, you know, when that subject came up and we were asking why, why now, or why in this way, or is this a setup? Uh, all of these events were preceded by something else that happened a couple of days ago. And uh, it was something you hear about a little more in the United States because it tends to make the news more, but it does happen here in Canada as well. And it's uh, called the uh, National... I was surprised. I didn't know about this until very recently. Like in the last couple yeah. of years. I'd never heard of this before. I know about it in the yeah. U.S. Didn't yes. know about it here. So we do have a National Prayer Breakfast in Canada. Now, uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, I sent you a link, and I'll put it up there. And uh, if you can click on the photos individually, that would be great as well. But um, For nearly 60 years, the annual National Prayer Breakfast has brought church leaders and friends together to pray for our country. Common sense conservatives will always defend every Canadian's right to worship and uphold our cherished and shared values of faith, family, and freedom. Okay. Um, no party that I know of has taken a position against defending every Canadian's right to worship up and, and uphold our cherished and shared values of faith, family, and freedom. Uh, so uh, conservatives, you're not special here. Uh, number two, um, there is a little, exactly, uh, Kit Stewart, uh, well, you'll read it, Mr. Grizzly, if you would like to. Freedom of religion is already protected within Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It doesn't need protection by the 
Conservative Party of Canada. Unless there's some truth to the rumor, Pierre would use a notwithstanding clause to override the charter. Mm -hmm. For certain other religions, maybe. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll notice that in the pictures there, um, you see a picture uh, next to uh, someone in a headdress as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons the National Prayer Breakfast in Canada is not as controversial as it is in the United States uh, is because, of course, given that we're a multicultural country, we see ourselves more as a mosaic than a melting pot, mm -hmm. and given that we're on a path to reconciliation, uh, but before that, uh, the whole concept of spirituality with regard to indigenous people is different. So the concept of prayer in general in Canada is not always necessarily associated with just one dominant religion, as is the case in the United States, where the National Prayer Breakfast is very, very, very evangelical. Oh, yes. yes. This one is very much more of a, a multi-faith event. Um, and this, there, therefore, it's not as controversial. I still don't want it taking place on Parliament Hill, though. I don't because I'm I don't not believe sure that. Would, I'm not sure it takes place. I it it's absolutely but. should. It shouldn't. Mm. That's but, the people's house, and it needs to represent all people, and not all people are religious. No, but it should also represent people who are religious. So there's no problem. There's there's no problem for me. There's no problem with if there would be a national prayer breakfast on the hill if the same members and same whatnot are perfectly willing to go to a national. Atheist Day event on the hill, or, or something, or Agnostic Day on the hill. As well, they well. tried that in it's, the U.S. with um, the uh, yeah the Satanists, but they weren't. They're not. They're not evil. Yeah. There's these, these are the folks who got upset when when a politician posted the Ten Commandments on a public um, institution, yes. a lot of a public institution. He's like, well, I'm going to put up a statue of Baphomet. Yeah. And and the, the Christian right lost their mind. They're like, well, if you're going to do that, which is in violation, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And, and it's it, the, the whole point was, you know, to make them look ridiculous. And yeah. they did a good job of it. Yeah. And it's the same uh, same thing that the, the, the Jewish community uses in the United States to uh, make arguments uh, against anti-abortion laws, for example. Mm. Right. Because if we're talking about freedom of religion, well, then the Jewish faith. Yeah doesn't believe at life and conception. Neither so, does Islam. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So the thing when making these comments, the reason why I said I don't, uh, I'm not particularly all there with you is the concept that you can't have an event on the hill if it's not all inclusive for everyone all the time is not the standard. At least it's not for me. And so like, no, you can have specific events. You can have an event for religious people, for religious, for for pious people for like this, so long as you have equal opportunity for events for those who are not and you are willing to attend both like this you're willing to talk with hear the message and, br and bring the perspective of both because if everything has to be for everyone all the time then you know re replace national prayer breakfast with national autism breakfast and also well, why autism and not cancer yeah, I, I you just you just got one group, so mm. that's the part. It doesn't bother that part. Doesn't bother me. This, but I just want you to know that this is that was May seventh. Yes. So we have the National Prayer Breakfast. We have Arnold Ver Vierson. Mm -hmm. We have the March for Life. We have the March. All in the space of three days. Mm -hmm. Rather suspect, right? Okay. Well, it's not suspect. It's just, no, I'm not suspect. The, the, it's just, it's like, all the, the coordinated and organized. The National has been around for 60 years, so I'm sure mm -hmm. that the people, when they did the March for Life, when they picked their day, hey, like this, this is in the news one day, this is one in the news one day, this gives, you know, this gives you a, a extra coverage, we get extra coverage, hey, it's a win for everyone for two or three days now, rather than just one day, the nation is focused on this message. So again, this is just good PR. It's not good PR that's used for positive means, but it's good PR. Because, you know, I can't, in this case, it's don't hate the game, hate the players. Right. I don't hate, though. But as the expression goes. Don't be goes, hating. Don't be hating. But as the expression goes, right? Don't diss the game, diss the players in this, in this case. 
Um, so they're playing the game according to the way the game should be played. But just the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because whenever um, people from the center right towards the left on the political spectrum start pointing out that, uh, hey, conservatives are actually talking about abortion, then you have the whole machine on the right go, oh my God, liberals again talking about abortion. What is it with these people? And that's where you get the PR thing. We'll never use it on abortion. Why do you keep on bringing up abortion? Because you raised it first. You were the first to raise the concept of using the notwithstanding clause to override charter protection rights. So you were the first to decide next. to stand up in the House and read a petition having to do with the subject and use the word preborn. You start the conversation. Yeah, so don't get mad when we accuse you of something we believe you want to do. But then they run to the conservative press, and then they bat their eyelashes. Oh, my God, liberals again. Like this because they start history from the moment the liberals started complaining, yeah. not from the provocation. No, of course not. Of course not. That's too easy. Right. So... You have uh, all that stuff going on. There's going to be screaming. There's going to be yelling for a while. This and then the subject will go back. But this is now an issue. Like I'm, I'm not understanding Pierre Polyev's strategy again. Again, if you're leading by twenty and you already know you have the campaign life coalition vote, because I mean, who else are they going to vote for? Really? Yeah. Right. So um, you've got that locked up. You shouldn't be needing to throw red meat like this to them. And now for him saying that he will never use it going on on the record, that's going to create some issues for him as well. Because now how does he maintain that? How does he maintain that line when he says never? Now, of course, he can go into those one on one events with them and say, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hey, guys, that you know, I, that I had to say that. But um, again, going all in on Israel when he wants the youth vote, denying that he will use notwithstanding clause on matters that don't have with the judicial system, that loses another bunch. Saying he will use the notwithstanding clause on matters having to do with the judicial system, that loses another bunch. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Because the, let's just say that if I uh, were working for the Liberal Party, there would have been a period of about two or three months where I'd be sitting there and going, oh my God, he's knocking the stuffing off us on anything. Please, Bank of Canada, lower the interest rates. We need something mm. uh, to happen, but something that would not be up in our control. And by doing what they did with the budget and still doing what they're doing by removing the capital gains thing out of uh, the first estimates bill and making it a standalone and, you know, having these uh, situations come up where he's starting to slip, he's starting to get nervous, he's starting to panic, he's starting to make some mistakes and the mistakes are starting to pile up and they may not be big, be big right now, but I'd be sitting there going, holy crap, he's finally handing us stuff. What did he say? Let's grab that. Okay, let's go hammer that. That's our thing today. What the conservatives do, find one thing that you said, take it out, rise it up, just get everybody coordinated talking about it, lighting a couple of brush fires, mm -hmm. see if the conservatives will dance to try to stomp them out. Just, he's, actually giving, he's actually leaving material now. Because for oh, a yes. while, he was so damn disciplined that he wasn't leaving much. So I'd be no. sitting there going, hoo hoo, okay, come on, bring it on. Now, whether or not the liberals have the comms to do that. That's the thing. And whether or not they have the hunger or the killer instinct. That remains to be seen at the moment. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, not... Uh, uh, I don't trust the man further than I can throw him and I can't pick him up. Well, yeah. I, I just, I, I just cannot buy 
that once if he's prepared to use the power in one area, he's not prepared to use the power in all areas. I, I, I know. Yeah. Yeah. We know him well enough to know what he's like and what he'll probably do. Most likely do. I'm sure it's planned. Yeah. <sighs> Conservatives have kind of, there's no progressive conservatives anymore. The, the current crop of reformers have kind of gone right off the rails. And, and they're going to rob you of your rights. And they're also going to complain about... Well, Canada, this is the last straw. I mean, lid. Really, Tim Hortons? Paper lids that disintegrate in your mouth? Come on. This is just another example of something trying to help the environment when it's actually going to have the opposite effect. If we have a plastic lid, at least it's recyclable. But this, disintegrating in your mouth as you're trying to drink your coffee? No thanks. I don't know about you, but until Tim Hortons gets rid of this paper lid, I'm done with Tim Hortons. Um. See, now, see, this isn't appropriate. This should not in any way, shape, or form be a party. This is the thing, right? Or her party logo should not be that. She should not be attacking a corporation that way. This is, this is like, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> oh, at least, at, at least the plastic's recyclable and cardboard isn't. <laughs> it's compostable, but, but, but like, this is like, you do not like a business move, a marketing decision uh, that a company made personally. That's for your personal Twitter feed, Leanne. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, it should, no. Putting not her party logo up there, attacking a corporation for trying to make a difference. And, and here's the thing. Tim Hortons has been on the receiving end from uh, climate activists for a long time because of the lids, because of, uh, at one point in time, they used a certain amount of plastic in their paper cups. They've been, you know, admonished for a while so now that they're doing the right thing you've got a conservative now remember the conservative party voted that climate change was not a real thing <sighs> like i just <sighs> Exasper exasperated all the damn time yeah yeah all right uh looking south of us um marjorie Actually, three thousands, names thousands yeah. Thousands across the country. Yeah, the franchises. Yeah. Thousands. Um, Marjorie Three Names. Oh, yeah. Decided that she had enough of Speaker Mike Johnson. And since them turfing Kevin McCarthy worked so well, that, well, all she needed to do was to do that again and it would go well. Uh, now, she said it. She introduced the motion quite a while ago, but uh, wasn't doing anything with it. Was just sort of hey, holding it uh, as a sword over his head. Well, she pulled the trigger just out of the blue one day. And uh, so they held a vote on it. Uh, and, uh, well, basically, um, she introduced it and then a procedural motion was introduced right away to not even actually debate that, but to just table it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, she lost 359 to 43 <laughs> uh, because uh, the Democrats decided that, hey, uh, we actually have a guy that uh, kept, got a budget passed somehow and got all those aid packages passed for Taiwan and Ukraine specifically and Israel somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know what? And he said he would and he did find a way. So, um, yeah, we're going to dance with the devil we know. So, uh, we're going to vote to keep him stay and, uh, you're going to lose. Now, the thing is, is that still 359 to 43, you would think it would be much closer because, well, I mean, in the house, the Republicans have currently have a one seat majority because, you know, they've been losing people. They've been losing a lot of people. There have been some people that have just, there are some people that have up and quit. And there are some people that have waited, like, because, you know, if there's six, X number of months before an election, right, you have to hold a by election of some type. Because there's some couple of people that have waited until like one day after the date where they can't be replaced so that the seat will remain empty until the next election mm -hmm. to decide to do that. 
It's like, oh, no, no, no. It's like, you don't understand. I'm not leaving and you're going to replace me. Like, you're actually losing the vote because I'm going to leave in six, seven, eight, nine, now. <laughs> and now you can't replace me. That's how much bad blood there is going on there. Oh, yeah. All right. So um, now it seems that um, the interesting thing about that is that there were uh, more Republican votes to oust Johnson than there were to oust McCarthy. Sorry, there were more votes to oust Johnson than there were to, to oust McCarthy overall. Yes. But in this case, it was Democrat votes because 32 of the 43 votes to kick Johnson out actually came from more left-leaning Democrats. Sort of like the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez sort of wing. Mm -hmm. So that means she only got 11 Republican votes for her thing. Wow. Even though there was 43 in all. So now she's in a situation where... Um, more progressives supported her move to get Mike Johnson out than Republicans. And she needs to go out and explain how her brilliance managed to orchestrate that feat. I mean, I don't know how much her cred in the party is going to suddenly plummet now that she tried to remove the speaker and she got the support of more Democrats than actual Republicans to do that. <laughs> the majority of the Republican majority in the House did not support her. I know. Crazy, right? <laughs> and the other thing is uh, she kind of went against uh, Von Schitt's and Pants because he posted on Truth Social that now is not the time to oust Johnson while still claiming that he loved three names for her fight in her spirit. <laughs> Mike Johnson, after the vote, said, hopefully this is the end of the personality politics and the frivolous character assassination that has defined the 118th Congress. It's regrettable. It's not who we are as Americans, and we're better than this. It's like, but it's who you guys are as Americans, and no, you're mm -hmm. not better than this, Mike. <laughs> it's like, it's like... <laughs> You're not better than that, Blanche. You are in that chair. <laughs> All right? It's just, <clears throat> oh, my word. Yeah. Yes. Now, um, <laughs> I'm, it's just, I'm so, like, how do these people, this guy can't even shoot straight. Oh, my God, it's unbelievable. So, anyway, Mike Johnson survived. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's stock took a huge hit. Huge, huge, huge hit. Uh, uh, yeah, now she has to explain to uh, her constituents why it is that more Democrats liked her idea than Republicans did. So, yeah, I yeah, have a feeling... I have a hard time with that one. Eh? Yeah, I have a feeling she's going <laughs> to... She says she's going to fasten your seatbelts, darling. It's going to be a bumpy night. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, up here uh, in uh, this is the other thing um, when we're talking about PP, uh, he keeps on uh, lobbying, lobbying. <laughs> Funny, he keeps on <laughs> saying that he's against lobbyists. Um, now, but, but but doesn't his his uh, the the woman who runs the conservative party? Basically, isn't she uh, a lobbyist? Mm -hmm. Still is registered in Ontario. Uh, and, uh, well, he's tried to distance himself from lobbyists, right? Basically saying, you know, they're no good because they're useless. You know, I wouldn't have, the, there's, there's no point in having them. They serve no purpose whatsoever, even though, as we mentioned, Jenny Byrne uh, and uh, Melissa Lansman, two of the key players in his uh, inner circle, uh, both have a very heavy lobbying background. Mm -hmm. uh, now, yesterday, 
there was uh, something really interesting on at issue with a segment uh, on it where they talked about uh, Pierre Polyev's comments on lobbying and lobbyists. And uh, I'd like to play it for you because uh, CBC, for some reason, has, uh, and not that I'm complaining, by the way, has uh, decided that it was going to do a bit of a deeper dive into his claims. So um, let's see if we can play the, the section from that issue yesterday, and then we'll, uh, we'll go into it. Okay, just give me a sec here. I'll load it up. <clears throat> okay, here we go. At issue, the corporate lobby. Pierre Poiliev has come down hard on lobbyists. It's my experience with the corporate lobbyists in Ottawa, the main groups there, have been that they have been utterly useless. But dozens of executives and lobbyists have attended high-end fundraising events headlined by Poiliev. So what's to be made of Poiliev's message to corporations to stand against his record of meeting with lobbyists at fundraisers? Let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. I know everyone has lots to say about this. Andrew, you wrote about it, so you get to, you get to start. What do you make of um, the, the message that he's sending and then his actions and how his actions line up with that? Well, I, I wish lobbyists were totally useless. In my experience, <laughs> in my observation, all too often, they're, they're fully earning their pay, that uh, government policies are all too often framed to make life easier for business rather than forcing them to work for a living. So if there was somebody who came along and said, you know what, uh, we're going to get government out of, the out of bed with business and business out of bed with government, we're not going to be pro providing any more subsidies or special favors to businesses, so fire your lobbyists because we're not going to listen to them, all of that would be great. But that's not what he said. If you actually you know, listen to his speech or read the piece he wrote for the National Post, it's, it, he, he doesn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop meeting with lobbyists. He doesn't say, I'm going to stop giving handouts to business. He doesn't say, I'm going to rein in lobbying in, with any new regulations. And he doesn't say to business, uh, stop you know, playing politics, stop cozying up to parties. He basically says, enlist on my side. Uh, first of all, he's saying, I'm not going to bring you any policies unless you, first of all, make them popular with the public. So I'm not going to take any risks or get out in front or, you know, lead. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, he says, uh, if I do bring any policies you like, I expect, quote unquote, I expect you to get out and sell them for me. So basically, he's conscripting business as marketing agents for, for conservative policies. Um, that is not quite the, the tough love, you know, separation of business and state message that I think some people were taking at. It's just simply switching, you know, from uh, business cozying up to the liberals to cozying up to the conservatives. Though the, the fact that he's calling them useless and has previously said, I would never uh, spend any time with anyone on Bay Street, and then, you know, we find out he's done three or four fundraisers on Bay Street. I mean, there is ov some obvious hypocrisy there that I think would confuse Canadians a little bit in terms of what he's actually trying to defend, Althea. Well, I think, you know, part of what he's saying there, and Andrew's right on all the points that he made, um, is he's also trying to muddy the waters because one of the probably the strongest attacks against Mr. Podiev thus far has been the relationship that he has with his senior advisor, Jenny Burns, who is who has a lobbying company that lobbies the Ontario government. And so um, I think he's trying to muddy the waters with that mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense that, well, you know, a puck on all your houses. And we've seen some of the questions in, in the House of Commons this week attacking uh, the NDP leader's brother. Uh, we've heard attacks flying on the Liberal side as well. So I think it's, it, if he's trying to protect himself by making it seem like everybody else is doing this. I think the very strong stance that he has taken against um, the lobbying community, or I sh we should say certain groups within the lobbying community, like he has named the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, the Canadian Business Council, uh, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Um, almost makes you wonder, like, is there a conservative waiting in the wing to replace these businesses with their own? Um, but it it speaks to, um, I think what he's really saying, yes, is I don't, yes, I don't want to take risks, but also it's pretty obvious, you know, everybody in the advocacy movement would know that if you want politicians to respond to something, you will need to make it easy for them. So you need the pe people to demand it. I don't think that that is new. That's just stating the obvious. I think 
what, you know, this was an editorial about capital gains, supposed to be, and he never took a position. He basically told business, go out and sell this policy for me yeah. so yeah. it can be easier for me to vote against yeah. the government's bill yeah. because the people that I'm courting support from, they are all supportive of this, or many of them are. That's what public opinion polls tell yeah. us. Yeah. So there's just so many different messages at play, and I agree with Andrew's point about it was quite something to say, well, these people are in bed with the liberals or not, uh, they were not opponents enough of the liberal government, get on my side, lobby basically for me, sell my policies, and then I will be responsive. Okay, Chantal. I, uh, I don't disagree about uh, trying to divorce himself from some inside the bubble, I would say, controversies mm -hmm. over lobbying. I don't think that uh, most people anywhere in Canada are worrying about uh, Jenny Byrne and her lobbying ties. But I thought the first goal was to uh, get off the hook on the capital gains tax That's changes. Right. Uh, they, what the Liberals have done is usually these changes would have been part of a larger budget bill that the Conservatives are set to oppose. They've hived it off so that they are meant to force the Conservatives to vote for or against that specific issue. Mm -hmm. and. I don't think uh, Mr. Poliev wants to fall into the trap of voting for uh, against this this change yeah. because it goes against his branding as a commons people Common sense, defender. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he's he's kind of using this as as a step to say, well, you, you know, if you can't make the case, why should I make the case for you? Yeah. But uh, that being said. I, I don't believe a liberal gov uh, conservative government will do without a lobbyist. And I don't believe that cons the conservative party should stop lobbyists from attending fundraisers. Yeah. Yeah, and there's uh, so nothing yes, wrong with there that. Some to be clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you're not going to stand at the door and say, mm, "Were well, you a lobbyist?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if so, you can't give me money yeah. and come yeah. to my dinner. Yeah. They don't invite people to those fundraising dinners in the sense of you come by invitation only. Yeah. But I also think that the lobbying industry has had a really good ride uh, from the business, the corporate sector, since we've moved to political financing that excludes big business. Why? Because it makes lobbyists more important to all those mm. lobby groups mm. because mm. they can't anymore uh, say, we're giving you a big check, give yes. us a hearing, which is probably good, but which is, I think, worked wonders for lobbyists. Yeah, it means that they have to go to these things and they have to try and talk to people directly. Andrew? Well, there's a simpler way to put lobbyists out of business and that's stop giving out special favors of the kind that lobbyists lobby for. So. Partly it's a policy question, but I agree with Chantal. This is yet another policy question uh, on which conservatives you would expect the conservatives to be taking a conservative position. So this on capital gains on top of uh, the replacement ban on replacement workers, on top of subsidies to electric vehicle battery plants. On each of these, uh, Poyeva is basically ducked and, and, and not, said any, not taking any position, but now he's turning it into a virtue. It just shows how tough I am on business that I'm going to make business uh, yeah. make its own case. I mean, that, that, that could be construed as quite brilliant political tactics, Althea. <laughs> well, just to go back to the, the relationship between, you know, the fundraisers and the lobbyists, I think, you know, maybe it's like a, a very obvious thing here in the bubble, but yeah. a lot of these lobbyists are former partisans, you know, like they were working for Stephen Harper and now they went to, for a GR yes. firm or a public relations firm. And like, these are the same people that volunteered during the election to knock on doors and work in the war rooms. So it's basically like you're going to a fundraiser with your friends. It's sure. grotesque. Uh, but that is the <laughs> way it works. And I don't know that people outside of this town realize that. The other th truth, frankly, is that MPs will continue to go to events. I have been yeah. to events this week and I have seen MPs yeah. at events because yeah. these are their constituents. And frankly, they want to say hello and they want to learn about the policy options. And yes. another truth, frankly, is that yeah. lobbyists do do useful work because a lot of times the government drafts legislation in a vacuum and they don't yeah. realize the un un uh, unintended consequences yes. of their actions. And it is lobbyists who work for like, uh, where we're hired to work for a certain group of people that say, oh, wait a second, if you do this, okay. yeah, this yeah. is the impact on my sector. If it has unintended consequences for Mr. and Mrs. Canada, they're out of luck. 
If it has unintended consequences for somebody who can pay $10,000 to a lobbyist, then they get a sympathetic but, but, hearing. Yeah, but it's legal. But it's, yeah, but, but but it's legal. But it's, it is legal. It's Let's be legal. clear. No, no, no. Chantal, no, 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 last but, word. But yes. Last word. But sometimes you do bring knowledge to the table if you're a lobbyist that impacts Mr. or Mrs. Canada. And if you don't listen to any of it, you won't know when. Okay. And it's up to the politician okay. listening to make that call whether oh. this was just self-interest or whether there are really, uh, you know, this yeah. this will have collateral consequences okay. that will amount to collateral damage. Wow. Yeah. Indeed, right? So we've already at, at talked. At that point, I thought Andrew Coy, the way he came off right from the top rope, and he did, he did write an article about it in the Globe and Mail. Yeah, and it was he was bang on when it comes to that. Yeah, and I don't often good. agree with him, but lately I find myself agreeing with a lot of the things he's been saying. And is it because I mean, it falls in line with my narrative? No, it's because I think he's right. <laughs> we say on the show, right? Andrew Coyne is one of these colonists. For some reason, we do not know. Like so he could like so nail it one day and miss and it completely the next. Yeah. So completely, exactly. Um, and I'd like to read, actually, his piece, because it's really good. Excuse me. Ever since the Liberals unveiled their surprise increase in the capital gains tax in last month's budget, the question on everyone's lips has been, what will Pierre Polyev say about it? Well, maybe not everyone's lips, but certainly on some people's conservatives, for example. After all, conservatives are supposed to be against taxes and tax hikes of all kinds, and leaders of the opposition are supposed to oppose. Surely the conservative leader would have, uh, would have to take the bait. Otherwise, he would have to explain to his followers why he had once again failed to oppose the opposing, uh, sorry, oppose the governing liberals on a major question of economic policy, as he had failed to do so on subsidies for electric vehicle batteries, for example, or the ban on replacement workers. Well, the days have just flown by, and at least we have, yeah, and at last we have our answer. Intriguingly, it's, quote, what are you asking me for? Only instead of a craven abdication of leadership, the talented Mr. Polyev has managed to turn it into a boast, even a philosophical, philosophical credo. In a striking piece in Friday's National Post, Mr. Polyev acknowledges that, indeed, investors and business leaders have been pressing him to lead the charge on the capital gains issue, why they've, been, why they've fairly been, quote, blowing up my phone. Quote, they yelp, what are you going to do about this? My answer, no, what are you going to do about it? Whoa, who saw that plot twist coming? But there's a point to it. Business, he complains, has been too content to roll over in the face of liberal attacks on investment in an entrepreneurship. Quote, gutless executives prefer to, quote, suck up to the liberals relying on their, quote, useless and overpaid lobbyists rather than taking their case directly to the voters. Got a beef? Then, with the liberals, you're on your own. Why should I sell your bleat? This represents an evolution in the populist anti-corporate pose Mr. Polyev has been trying to strike of late. Read quick, read quickly, it might even look like Mr. Polyev has given business a bit of tough love, urging them to show greater self-reliance, less dependence on government. And it's true, business has been all too willing to close up to the National Natural Governing Party over the years, accepting destructive and intrusive government regulations as the price of government handouts. Any leader that put a stop to this sordid exchange would earn the thanks of a grateful nation. <laughs> but if that was what Mr. Podiev meant, he could have said so. He might have said, quote, don't bother coming to a conservative government for handouts because we won't give you any. And don't waste your time lobbying a conservative government either. We're going to do what's right for Canada, whether business likes it or not. So you mind your business and I'll mind mine. I'll stay out of business and you stay out of politics. But that's not what he says in the piece, is it? He doesn't say he will stop giving handouts to business and far from telling businesses to stay out of politics, he's effectively demanding they enlist on his side. On the one hand, he wants that he won't take up any of their, he warns that he won't take up any of their policy proposals unless business has already sold the public on it. And this is uh, back also in line with his, like, my laws, the people will determine whether or not my laws are constitutional, Right. I trust the common man as being the expert. This is all variations on that theme that he's been putting out for the past while here. <laughs> Business won't get nothing from me unless they convince the people first. When they start telling me about your ideas on the doorstep in Windsor, St. John's, Trois-Rivières, and Port Alberni, then I'll think about enacting it. On the other hand, so on the other hand, on those policies he does take up, he wants business to provide him with the political cover. 
If I do pursue your policy, I expect that you will continue to advocate for it within those, sorry, continue to advocate for it with those same Canadians in those same neighborhoods until the policy is fully implemented. As campaign messages go, it's pretty nervy. I won't lift a finger for you if it involves the slightest political risk for me, but I expect you to carry water for me for as long as it takes if I take a risk for you. Essentially. It's not the, how Trump... It's not that he wants businesses to stop sucking up to the liberals, in other words, so much as that he wants them to start sucking up to the conservatives, preparing public opinion for policies he can then adopt in safety, and campaigning for them, and by implication him, until they have been adopted. Notice the language too. I, me, my. If I pursue your policy, I expect. Starts telling me. I get it. He's on a roll. He obliterated his rivals in the leadership race. He's 20 points ahead in the polls. Not only does he not owe business any favors, but he is in a position to start issuing demands. But I can't be the only one left with the impression that it all seems to have rather gone to his head. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny. I think it's also very accurate. Yeah. Yes, those are <laughs> still they have those are a lot of words for calling Skippy a coward. <laughs> ah, have I told you lately that I loved you? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, he's trying to again, right? Uh, I don't like lobbyists. I'm here for the workers. I. You know, I'll let the people decide. Don't, don't, don't believe it. I will never use the notwithstanding clause on abortion. Uh, don't, yeah. Don't, 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 don't believe that. He lies. He just does. <sighs> All right. Um, today in gay. Boop, da, 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 da. Uh, there's been a lot of news, uh, rainbow news lately. Uh, the m most important one is that uh, the United Methodist Church delegates have repealed a ban on LGBT clergy and have barred regional leaders from pursuing punishing clergy who officiate same-sex weddings. The vote took place at the church's natural, national gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, it seems that uh, there's been some changes in the church because it seems that a lot of the conservative wing of the church has left for some reason. Um, PBS reported back at in, uh, around Christmas of last year, uh, one of the dominant Christian denominations in the U.S., the United Methodist Church, is exper experiencing a major split. Since 2019, more than 7,000 congregations have received approval to leave the church. The factions have disagreements in theology, namely how the church considers LGBTQ plus ministers and congregants. So people have been leaving. And it seems that enough people have left now that they had the vote. They normally have their Congress every four years. This one was five years since the previous one because COVID. And uh, with no debate, no debate, wow. by a vote of 692 to 51. Wow. <laughs> they lifted the ban on LGBTQ clergy. <clears throat> That's pretty well. Yes. They removed the rule, quote, forbidding, quote, self-avowed practicing homosexuals from being ordained or appointed as ministers. Now, past general conferences of the church had steadily reinforced the ban and related penalties amid debate and protests. Uh, now, the change doesn't mandate or even explicitly affirm LGBTQ clergy, but it means the church no longer forbids them. So it's not like, welcome! It's just not stay away. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's possible that uh, the change will apply mostly to U.S.-based churches because the church bodies in the United Methodist Church uh, of other nations have the rights to impose the rules of their own regions. And that's why a lot of people left. Uh, the measures take effect immediately upon conclusion of the general conference. So it means they're in place at the moment. Bishop Karen Olivido, the first openly lesbian bishop at the United Methodist Church, says, quote, It seemed like such a simple vote, but it carried so much weight and power, as 50 years of restricting the Holy Spirit's call on people's lives has been lifted. People can live fully into their call without fear. Um, then she basically said, The church we've loved has found a home for us. 
That's about that for sentiment. Also passed was a rule that forbids direct superintendents or regional administrators from penalizing clergy for either performing or refraining from performing a same-sex wedding. So again, it's not everybody say, hey, same-sex weddings, come over here. But it's like, if you choose to perform one, you won't be punished. And if you choose not to perform one, you won't be punished. It also forbids them from forbidding or requiring a church from hosting a same-sex wedding. The measure removes scaffolding around various LGBTQ bans that have been embedded in the official church and law and policy. So there's also sort of like an omnibus element that goes through all the policy and wherever there was something that would affect negatively the community, they're now making it neutral. Okay. Um, Delegates are expected to vote soon on whether or to replace the church officials' social principles with a new document that no longer calls, quote, for the practice of so that, that no sorry, that no longer calls, quote, the practice of homosexuality incompatibility, incompatible with Christian teaching, and describes a marriage as between two people of faith rather than between a man and a woman. Penalties for conducting same-sex marriages were also rescinded. And uh, the bans on considering uh, LGBTQ candidates for ministry or f- and funding for gay-friendly ministries were also lifted. So, for example, if you do want to be United Methodist Church that says, hey, gays, welcome here, your funding will not be affected. Oh. So, basically, they're saying, listen, you choose what you want to do. So, it's not all of our churches in the United States are rapidly going pro, but, you know, with a vote of, what was it again? 692 to 51, there's going to be a few churches, I assume, in the United Methodist Church uh, wing, I guess, in the United States that will be uh, opposing. But at least where the places, uh, the the places that want to be fully welcoming will be able to be, and uh, the places that choose not to be i guess they'll still be allowed to be but nobody will they're basically passing a rule saying you don't have to make this a thing either positive or negative if you don't want to right and if you want to i guess you can um but it's a it's way more live and let live also uh in Canada, there's a group called Dignity Network Canada, uh, which is a group um, that uh, it describes itself as basically a network of 65 Canadian organizations working to advance Canada's support of global LGBTQ human rights. Uh, and often um, Dignity, as opposed to other groups, uh, often does work with religious organizations as well. Uh, they have had a meeting over the the past few days uh, where um, they're talking about human rights. We know often on the show we talk about the Rainbow Railroad, for example. So that we will, um, where we're helping uh, to bring in people who are rainbow in countries where they risk imprisonment or death. Mm-hmm for being uh, openly gay and uh, try to bring some people to Canada so that they can enjoy a, a better life. Um, so Dignity Canada uh, connects organizations across Canada involved in supporting the human rights of people regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics globally. And Equitas, which is another group, they bring, they, they bring together, quote, 150 LGBTQI act activists from around the world to discuss solidarity and the defense of human rights at a three-day conference, quote, packed with panels and speakers covering the rise of rainbow ha- anti-rainbow hate globally, countries making progress, trends, funding needs, and more. And in Canada, this is going to eventually lead to the largest mobilization of queer groups in nearly 20 years over the course of the summer. Uh, There will be rallies that will take, uh, not the, sorry, not the summer, next week. There will be rallies taking place all across Canada next week to protest uh, the rise of uh, anti-rainbow hate. Um, So this is going on. And uh, there were some uh, wonderful images uh, from the conference there. And a news release where um, it says here, um, 
people in 2S LGBTQI communities continue to face discrimination, violence, and marginalization in Canada and globally. Canada remains steadfast in its commitment to advancing their human rights and socioeconomic inclusion. Today, Anita Vandenbelt, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Development, participated in Dignity Networks Canada's opera, sorry. Dignity Network Canada's opening panel discussion, which included 2S LGBTQI plus human rights defenders. During the event, she announced $1.7 million in funding from Canada to be dispersed over three years for 2S LGBTQI plus initiatives around the world. Canadian organization Rainbow Railroad will receive $700,000 for the international network on 2S LGBTQI plus forced displacement initiative. This project aims to improve the protection of forcibly displaced rainbow people around the world through research and convenings of civil society organizations, public stakeholders, and people experiencing forced displacement. Rainbow Railroad is a global not-for-profit organization that helps at-risk rainbow people get to safety. The U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, will receive an additional $1 million for the multi-donor LGBTI Global Human Rights Initiative, which works to help protect rainbow people in developing countries from violence, discrimination, stigma, and criminalization. The project conducts research to inform policy, supports communications and social and behavioral change to reduce stigma and discrimination, and provides direct and emergency support to individuals and organizations. The initiative while managed by USAID, is implemented by the Astrea Lesbian Foundation for Justice, a philanthropic organization working to support the human rights of rainbow people around the world. So this is a really, really wonderful thing, Kits and Cubs, because as a, a common call or rallying cry, when it comes to these types of global movements, we hear it a lot in the black movement as well as none of us are free until all of us are free. Mm -hmm. And that's why this type of uh, work, Rainbow Railroad, why it's, why it's such an important organization, why the government of Canada uh, doing some stuff uh, and putting some money aside to help make sure that rainbow people in other countries uh, are, not, uh, are not only safe, but if they're not safe, can escape to safety uh, is very, very important. So yes, uh, yesterday... Um, the Dignity Network with Equitas together uh, brought people um, from all around the world who defend human rights, who defend rainbow human rights. And they met with uh, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. And uh, they discussed these things about what we can do to try to make life a little better for our rainbow brothers and sisters all around the world. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you uh, have uh, of time there, there's uh, just a couple of pictures of the event that, uh, that's put up, put up there. But if you care about this issue, uh, I really do recommend uh, following uh, Dignity Network, Rainbow Railroad, Rail, Rainbow Railroad, and there's something called EGAL, Equality for Gays and Lesbians Everywhere. Uh, these are organizations, and Equitas as well, organizations that uh, do a lot of good work and deserve your uh, support and uh, encouragement. But yeah, once again, kids, if you're paying attention, slowly and surely, right? Mm -hmm. Fairness, equality, and all that kind of stuff is breaking out around the world. And uh, right now, like there was in Uganda, there seems to be a push in Ghana as well uh, to try and uh, criminalize um, same-sex relations. And uh, the several governments, again, are trying to apply pressure by saying, you know, this could cost you billions of dollars in international trade. Uh, so you might not want to do that. So... Uh, because that, you know, we have to be, uh, we have to be uh, vigilant. We have to celebrate the wins, but we have to be vigilant where we can see in other countries that uh, there is some creep as well. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, do you have something for us? Uh, <clears throat> I do. I do have. Um, where did it go? I had to save something here. I don't know if you are aware of this, so I thought I would uh, put this on the screen and we'll, we'll discuss it briefly. Uh, this was sent to me recently. I did hear about this earlier. I woke up, though. Uh, city police brought a, in Calgary, city police brought a pro-Palestinian encampment on the University of Calgary campus to a swift end mm. in a barrage of tear gas and flashbangs last night. Yes. So, yeah, they, they just like... Uh, now, this out. is... A yeah, interesting. Uh, 
the events on campuses in Canada, as we mentioned yesterday, have not been anywhere near as violent or belligerent as they have been in the United States. Um, when I heard that news today, uh, I found it very, very interesting that uh, the first place in Canada where the police decided to crack down was indeed in uh, Calgary. Because uh, it was one of the more, uh, probably, I, th I think it's one of the more recent camps, if I'm not mistaken. But yes, uh, pepper, ball guns, flashbangs, riot gear were used to dismantle the protests. There were about two dozen protesters who remained late uh, linking arms, but many had packed up and left after being warned that they could be arrested. Uh, shortly after 11 p.m. last night, uh, Calgary Time Police moved in, uh, but they had been uh, notified, uh, sending out, or been asked to intervene sometime around 6.30. Um, the, uh, the protesters had set up an encampment uh, after getting no response from university leadership to a letter it had sent days prior asking them about uh, divestment. Um, I'm, I don't know what the situation on campus was like. Nothing in the reporting that I had heard up until now seemed to indicate that there was anything violent or hateful going on. Uh, just that, okay, you've been doing it too long and uh, we're dismantling it. So um, right now we're seeing, uh, we're getting a basically a side-by-side -side view of what's happening in Montreal, for example, and what's happening in Toronto. We're in Montreal uh, where they pursued uh, to try to get an injunction and the judge decided that you know, nothing had real risen to a state of an emergency that would require an injunction. And then in Toronto where they gave people until a certain hour to disperse and then revise that saying, okay, well, so long as your protest remains peaceful, non-hateful and non-violent, mm -hmm. uh, then you can stay. But here in Calgary, we've, uh, the University of Calgary, we're just, we're, we're cracking down, we're, ta we're taking it apart. So now we're going to get to see side by side uh, which strategy yields which results. Because if in Calgary, uh, doing this causes uh, three more protests to pop up at three different parts of the city or something, or one bigger one to, to pop up somewhere else, then um, they may have created, you know, um, there's a movie I, you know, I watched back in the day. Remember The Gate? You ever see that one? It was a horror movie at one point. Mm. And uh, they they hit something and it breaks into pieces. Like I think it was like a garden gnome or something like that. And it breaks into like hundred like a whole bunch of little pieces. And then they all grow. They all become like tiny one hundred like little mini killer little gnomes just going. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like no, no, I don't recall that. Sorry. So, but it was like one of those things where you thought that you know if you just like smash it, it'll go away. And then you smashed it into a hundred pieces and every single one of those little pieces became their own thing. Mm. Right. So that's what, what people are wondering about when they're dismantling these protests. Like, sure, you can dismantle it in one place, but have you just created a bigger one that will start tomorrow or two more that will start in two other places later? Uh, so we, but here, that, that's the thing is now in Canada, we're seeing two approaches. We're saying, okay, you can keep on doing it if you remain peaceful, regulate yourself. And we're saying, you know, no, eight, nine, ten, crack down on them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see how things develop. If things become uh, more aggressive and more loud and more boisterous and more disruptive in Calgary, we'll know that that was a direct consequence of, of uh, coming down with the hammer. Really, really strong. Maybe before things had been given enough time to play themselves out. But uh, yes, indeed, we will uh, we will see what happens on that one. That was uh, some pretty uh, interesting news. Um, state, I, I was surprised that it happened this fast. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised. Um, in the United States, another thing that happened, of course, you'd have to be living under a rock to not know it, but uh, this was the week that Stormy Daniels testified not in the hush money trial wherever when they keep on saying that they are not saying the truth it's the election interference trial in new york because that's what the conspiracy is considered to have done it was to interfere with the election um it seems that the uh, testimony uh, was a tad tmi oh 
uh, at certain points. Um, the main reason she was on the stand was to establish that the encounter had indeed taken place, that there was right. something for which. Um, so the judge didn't need um, all the salacious details about what happened. Um, we learned some interesting things, like for example, what had happened, he had uh, met her at the door wearing silk pajamas, after which uh, she joked about him having stolen Hugh Hefter's uh, outfit and uh, told him to go put some clothes on, which apparently he did. Uh, apparently uh, he was asking her a whole bunch of questions about the industry in which she works, uh, with particular attention to uh, STD tests and whether or not uh, she had ever failed one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, it seemed that, uh, but he was asking all, all other stuff also, like about residuals and whatnot. So he's seeming like he was really interested uh, in it. She said that she found his questions somewhat uh, thoughtful. Uh, then she had to go to the bathroom, which was, of course, through the bedroom. And she went, and when she came back, apparently he was uh, on the bed in boxer shorts and stuff. Um, she says that... Uh, she says that she didn't say no, but she did feel there was a power imbalance because there was a security guard outside the main door and other things. Uh, didn't, didn't, wasn't really proud of it, um, but they had uh, continued communication because he was dangling a, a possible participation in The Apprentice uh, for her. Um, and it didn't look like it was materializing it was going to happen. He sort of said, you know, I really fought for you, but uh, the, 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 uh, my veto was vetoed, <laughs> essentially. So he wasn't able to get her on. Uh, so he tells her. Uh, but it seems like during that time, uh, it seems that uh, um, he would refer to her as Honey Bunch, and uh, they would have some conversations, some of which uh, she put on speakerphone in front of her, her friends. So um, it's very clear that there was some type of relationship. Uh, we also heard testimony um, that would indicate uh, that both uh, Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal were in uh, Trump's Rolodex uh, at Trump Towers. And uh, you can tell that the relationship between them uh, was very different because Karen McDougal uh, claims that, uh, that they were in love, actually. So and uh, you can tell by the entrances on the Rolodex cards, how much attention was paid to one and how much attention was paid to the other, that there actually was a difference in the relationships uh, there. Um, the judge tried to caution many times, saying, you know, this is like TMI, we don't need to know all that, please just stick to the answers, we don't need embellishments, we don't need play-by-play, -play. thank you. Um, which caused the Trump team to uh, ask for a mistrial. So, it's like all these details about things we swear he's never done because he's still maintaining he's had he's had no relations with them. Um, these things that never happened are so salacious that we, yeah, we he can't get a fair trial now, so you got to throw that. And the judge said, yeah, yeah, but no, <laughs> that one. Um, but uh, more damning testimony actually happened after. Uh, because uh, Stormy Daniels was on the stand for about six hours over two days. She actually admitted right off the bat uh, on the stand, too, that she hates him. Yeah. So uh, that could be something that could be construed as uh, uh, construed by the jury as, uh, say, as being, you know, well, okay, well, she's here with a purpose of some kind. Um, the uh, Trump lawyers try to make it seem like it was an extortion situation. Um, not sure how successful they were on that. Uh, but after Daniels had spent uh, six hours over two days on the stand, um, former White House admin assistant Madeline Westerhouse was on the st stand, and her her office was just outside the Oval Office, and uh, she testified about an email confirming a February 27 meeting between Trump and Michael Cohen in the Oval Office that was to work out the terms of the reimbursement themselves. So. Uh, while Stormy Daniels' testimony is definitely interesting, she also testified that uh, when she asked about Melania, Trump said, don't worry about her. We don't sleep in the same room. Like anybody wondered about that. Um, but yeah, it seems that, uh, so while she was there, she you know, clearly established that the incident happened. Um, maybe a little too much color. Uh, maybe a little too much... Um, 
leading questions from the prosecuting attorney to get some of these salacious things somewhat on the record for the benefit maybe of the jury. Uh, <laughs> hey, any way you can sway, right? Yeah. But um, uh, but yeah, the the judge seemed visibly uncomfortable and uh, admonished a couple of times and uh, yeah, yeah. Said we, we don't need all of this. We can we 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 can fast forward over this, these bits, please. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Uh, but yes, it's, so it seems that they're they're they are bringing in some witnesses, uh, and then a, a star witness of some kind, like they had David Pecker at the beginning with this to establish certain things, and then they have some more technical witnesses that come and they bring documents, and whatnot, and then they bring in another sort of big witness, this time Stormy Daniels, and then they'll bring other technical documents like, you know, like the admin assistant saying, yes, we have this email and whatnot. The next one will might be Karen McDougal. Apparently, they met. Oh. Two at one of these events, yes. Um, so it seems that the trial is is going a bit in that way. So it's it's not big block, blockbuster witness after block button, blockbuster witness, you know, back to back to back. It's it's like they're brought in to establish something and then they bring out all the documentary evidence and then the star witness comes in and establishes something and then they bring in the documentary evidence. So it seems to be a fairly organized, uh, fairly well organized trial and being well, well argued on uh, the side of the prosecution. But uh, we never know, right? That's why you play the game because then the yeah. jury has their say. But uh, yes, the, uh, like I said, the testimony was given. Uh, a lot of people were paying attention to it. Probably not as salacious and ex ex explosive as some people had wanted, given the reason for which she was there specifically. It's just to establish that the events took place. And uh, no, no commentary about whether or not the events were uh, a good thing, a bad thing, a pleasurable thing, a welcome thing. Uh, Right. It's just, did the thing happen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Is there something, was there an event that actually happened for which the money needed to be exchanged? Yes. Okay. Good. And uh, that was the extent of it. So, um, so yeah, for, for people who had popcorn, maybe not everything that you wanted, but still, uh, still the prosecutor uh, managed to get some of that in. So, uh, Interesting. <laughs> oh, let's see. What else have we got here for you today? Well, you know what? We're getting close, actually. I think we should wrap up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I got a ton of work to do here in front of me, so I'm 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 not really concentrating on what we're talking about as much as I'd like to because I I just have responsibilities that I have to attend to. So let's uh, let's wind things up for the Friday show we've been on for two hours and 40 minutes so it's not like we didn't provide a, a lack of, of content today um, you know there's about 1250 viewers in the live stream right now across multiple platforms so thanks to each and every one of you and if you want to join in with the damn fam and get in on the chat you can uh, you can find us at uh, youtube.com backslash at True North Eager Beaver Media. And if you scan the QR code, if you're watching on a tablet and want to scan it with your phone, that's up on the screen right now. That'll take you directly to our YouTube channel where we'd love it if you uh, would like, share, and subscribe. If you like our show, we, we hope you can uh, share it with as many people as possible. And if you like our logo, the True North Eager Beaver logo, we now have a merch store, an Etsy store, so you can go to that store and purchase anything you find there. And if there's anything that you'd like to have in addition to that, just let us know and we will uh, we'll get it to you. We'll, uh, we'll make it for you and get it to you as long as you pay the purchase price, of course, because, you know, we, we, don't, we don't give things away for free. <laughs> the content is free for you to enjoy <laughs> and share to your heart's content. But if it's an actual physical product that we have to pay for, well, we can't afford to give that away because the operational costs alone are killing me right now. Mm. I haven't oh, even, I can't even pay my phone bill. Geez. I'm serious. No, I'm serious. It's like, that's, you know, that's the situation I find myself in right now. So if you're trying to text me, you're not going to be able to get a hold of me for a few more days. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Well, I forgot to pay the bill and then realized I didn't have enough money to pay it, so it's suspended until next Wednesday. So that's just how oh. it goes. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. It's not uh, a big deal. I have well, Wi-Fi access to everything at home. Just nobody can text me right now. Okay. Oh, and you can important. call me when I'm at home. Actually, you can actually call me because I have Wi-Fi calling enabled on my phone. Okay. Uh, very, very important news. According to Mishadika, Mateo said because he's sick, he grants everyone permission to be irresponsible today. I like the sound of that. Woohoo! Feel better, Mateo. Oh, we're sending you lots of healing energy. We hope that you feel very better very, very soon so that uh, you can get back to playing and learning and all that good stuff. Exactly. All right. Kids and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And you have the mouths from which we want the word to come. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to uh, make sure you get something from our merch store, as Mr. Grizzly mentioned, that QR code that's right underneath my chin is where you go. It's uh, if you go to Etsy and you look up for True North Eager Beaver merch store, uh, there you go. And you will be able to uh, get, uh, like as we mentioned, T-shirts and underwear and keychains and cups and all that good stuff. Oh, my. Ah, you got Kit Shea, MJ, going Mateo for PM. Ah, I think that would probably be a not so bad idea. I might be able to get behind that. Yep. <laughs> if you would like to support us in other ways, you can, thanks to the Ray Girl, who sponsors our pod page, podpage.com slash the true North Eager Beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. will bring you there. And if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. How about that? We make it so easy. And if you'd like to support us in another way, make like Kit Elaine, who says, have a beyond awesome day, everyone. And remember to smash the button before you leave. And you can do that by going to True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, where we have like, share, and subscribe. Three buttons for you to click or lick as you wish. We don't judge. Get yourself some happy and click those buttons today. And if you would like to help us in another way, then you can go to the Emergency Hydration Fund at the Beaver Lodge, our fancy term for our tip jar, and you can find it at our coffee page. The QR code that's by Mr. Grizzly's head up there will bring you there. Or if you use those digits of those beautiful hands or your voice prompt to go to ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there... You can find our tip jar if you have a couple of toonies or loonies jangling in your pockets and uh, you would like to encourage us to do more because you enjoy this product. We would be more more than grateful if you left us something there. And uh, we'd like to give a big thank you to Kit Dan, who uh, sent us a little something. We really appreciate that. Thank you, my good friend. Uh, also, Kit Wendy, who uh, recently sent us something saying, Cheers, gents. Appreciate you. You make my mornings, I'd be one cranky old gal without you. Ah, thanks so much. And then we have uh, Kit Chris, who said, love you guys, and sent us a little something. And Kit Cassie, who sent us something saying, still worth getting up early on Manitoba time to watch. Diversity of viewpoints in the damn fam chat. Broadens my mind and perspectives. Love from a now retired farmer. We got no, some... And we have Lola Gear. Lola Gear. Uh, you can get it in different colors and you can see the different colors that are available to you here there we go that's great got Kit Dan going I sent you something when you know when my friend <laughs> thank you so much uh, alright uh, so that's how you can uh, send us something and support us. If you would like to communicate with us, truenortheagerbeaver at gmail.com is our email address, at trueeager on uh, at Twitter. Uh, you can uh, send us messages on our uh, YouTube page as well, and uh, as well as our Facebook page, uh, True North Eager Beaver. Uh, and uh, there, sorry, sorry, Mr. Grizzly, because you're moving the screens, it's very distracting. I'm having sorry. trouble fo focusing, sorry. Um, oh, I like that in the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ooh, that was, that was very pretty. Yeah, I'm ordering one um, myself, actually. Excellent. Um, so, yes, 
please uh, be sure to do all of that because democracy is something that you do. If you live in Alberta, please get involved in the Alberta NDP leadership race. It's uh, getting a little spicy. And uh, it seems that uh, even the head and she is taking a couple of hits. So mm. uh, there's been some developments. So uh, like I said, you've got five good candidates. So get in there and uh, uh, you know, make your voice heard uh, to get uh, the best quality candidate you can. And if you happen to be living in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, please uh, find out what it is that you can do to help volunteer for the upcoming provincial elections. Maybe you can help at a polling booth, or maybe uh, you, again, have a candidate of choice, or maybe there's some nomination races that are still not uh, complete, and uh, you can uh, pop in there and uh, give a hand uh, where you can as well. Democracy is something that you do, so please get involved. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourselves and have an absolutely fantastic weekend coming up. I hope you have some good stuff planned. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 2024, Ooh. wear sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to imitate the voice of the guy who initially wrote that. Baz Lorman. Colonel Canuck, you guys are going straight down next year. No chance. I don't know what you mean by that. Where are we going? I'm going yeah, down south. That, 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 no, we don't respond to that. We, we need to no, put no, it I'm having fun with it. I'm having yeah, fun with yeah. it. There's no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know where we're going, but. Yeah. We don't. It's, it, it's our show, not their show. No, no. Uh, I just have fun. Yep. But this is my uh, chapeau that I wear in the sunshine with a lovely yes. feather. Uh, Swanty, to keep, beautiful to chapeau. Keep, well, to keep my head from getting burnt and uh, to, to cut back on the premature aging from UV rays. You do need a little bit of sun every day to get your vitamin D, uh, but that could be uh, literally on, on the back of your hand and you only need 15 minutes exposure. That's it. So you can go outside, stick your hands in the sun for 15 minutes and you're good. You're good to go. There you go. Get some cups. All right. Mr. Grizzly, cue the cock. Um, yeah. Let me just uh, remember where I put him. Oh, I, there, there he is. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Miss v. Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, uh, nothing much for me today on Easter Egg, just uh, more Edmonton, Vancouver tonight, and the International Ice Hockey Federation's Men World Championships gets uh, off to a start. So uh, go Team Canada, go. Um, I guess we're going down to Guantanamo Bay. Cuba, hey, let's go to Cuba. My sister goes there all the time. She has friends there. One of them owns a pub, a good Irish pub. Ooh, <laughs> maybe it's time for fruity drinks. <laughs> I'm all for fruity things. Oh, hey, hate watchers, keep watching us. Keep watching us. Toodles, poodles. See ya. Wouldn't wanna be ya. Ooh, 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 the shade, the shade.